cosmological arguments. Here we go. We're getting into the juicy stuff now. All right. Well, cosmological arguments uh, are arguments for the conclusion that God is the ultimate cause, ground, or explanation of the universe, uh, or all a contingent or dependent reality. And there's no better argument to start with than Aquinas' first way, uh, the argument from the unmoved mover. So we have Aquinas' first way. Uh, premise one, some things are moved. Two, whatever is moved is moved by another. Three, there cannot be an infinite series of movers, and so the conclusion is there must be an unmoved mover. And Aquinas' stock phrase was, and this is what all men mean by God. So, of course, Aquinas' first way is better, I think, understood as an argument from change. And it's crucially reliant on an act potency analysis of change. Basically, act refers to the various ways that things actually are. So I'm actually seated, you are actually listening to this video, and so on. Whereas potency refers to the various ways that things could be but are actually not. So for instance, I could be singing, but I'm actually not. I could be using a Zizek compression, but I'm actually not. I could be bald, but I'm not, and so on. And so on. Importantly though, act and potency are conceived as different ways of being or modes of existence. There is a real distinction between actual being and potential being. Potentials within this understanding are not nothing. Potentials actually come with them ontological commitment to a way of being, namely potential being. It's a kind of middle ground, as Fazer puts it, between full-blown actual being and sheer nothingness. And it's this metaphysical underpinning of the argument that I first would attack. I'd first argue that, at least by my lights, it's not sufficiently motivated. So Fazer, for instance, gives an argument from change for the act-potency distinction. It's one of his central arguments for it. And I actually criticized this in one of my blog posts, which I will link in the description. So at least some of the central arguments for the act-potency distinction for these different ways of being or modes of existence I don't find plausible. Of course, I think that things are actually various ways, and I also think that things can be other ways than they in fact are. But I don't think, that is, I reject, that this requires us to commit to some middle ground kind of being or existence, somehow in between full-blown actual being and sheer nothingness, on the other hand. The second thing that I would say is that this metaphysical underpinning is arguably incompatible with eternalism or four-dimensionalist eternalism, because under such a view, all times and contents of times are equally actual. They have an equal ontological status. And moreover, there is change over time, even within an eternalist, four-dimensionalist type view. But, of course, if there's change over time, that is the contents of space-time, in some sense, change, but everything, all the contents of space-time, are equally actual, well then change is not going to be the transition or reduction from potential being to actual being. Why does that matter? I mean, you could, of course, just reject four-dimensionalist eternalism. Well, it matters because this is an extremely contentious area within philosophy of physics, philosophy of science, and philosophy of time. And while philosophers are roughly evenly split between, let's say, the primary atheist view, which is presentism, and the primary b-theorist view, which is four-dimensionalist eternalism, while philosophers are somewhat roughly split between those, actually more philosophers adopt four-dimensionalist eternalism. So it's a formidable view. And so one is going to be saddled with a quite serious burden if one has a metaphysical view or analysis of change, which requires denying it. You're going to have to get into stuff about general and special relativity, various arguments from truth makers, and various other things that philosophers have quite aptly defended in favor of eternalism. Third, the act potency analysis of change requires pluralism about being, that there are multiple distinct ways of being. But I would reject pluralism, and I would argue that you should reject it as well. You can see, for instance, my video with Trenton Merricks. I will link that in the description as well. So that's the first thing that I do. I'd reject the metaphysical underpinnings of the argument. The second thing that I would do is I'd say, well, this conclusion doesn't necessarily follow from the premises, at least if we say that the unmoved mover is unmoved in all respects whatsoever. While each chain of actualizations of potential might be finite, the terminus of a given chain might be unactualized in one respect, or in respect of a particular causal power, and yet actualized in various other respects, or moved in various other respects that aren't relevant to that particular causal power of the series. So, for instance, consider that we might have a, a pot of water, right? The water is heated by, let's say, the bowl, which is heated by the stove, which, let's suppose, it's a fire stove, which is heated by the fire. Now, the relevant causal power of the series here is something like the power to heat. Now, all the secondary members in this series, all the non-first members, the non-primary members, have this power in a derivative way. The thing in the series with the kind of underived power, the power built into itself, 
the capacity of itself to heat things, is of course the fire. And so we have a finite chain of actualizations of potential here. And so the fire, at least with respect to the chain of actualizations of potential concerning heat, is going to be first. It's going to be primary in this particular series. It has that causal power in a kind of built-in or underived way. Yet the fire is perfectly able to be actualized in various other respects, unrelated to its power to heat. For instance, you could carry the stove across the room and it would still be able to be the unactualized actualizer in that particular chain of, let's say, heatings, but it would be actualized in various other respects. And so you're not going to be able to get to a thoroughly unactualized actualizer by means of this argument. We should also note here that the conclusion is extremely limited. First, it doesn't even entail that the unmoved mover or unactualized actualizer of a given per se chain of changes, it doesn't entail that it's unchangeable even in respect of the causal power of the series, let alone unchangeable in all respects whatsoever and so purely actual. And it also doesn't even get you close to God. Naturalists can easily accept that there is uh, some unmoved mover, let's say, or unactualized actualizer. There are boatloads of non-theist friendly first uncaused causes, which we can even suppose is, let's say, necessarily existent and it's first and so not dependent on or actualized by another. And in fact, I'm going to play for you guys a clip because I put together at least some proposals for this, and there are various others, but I put together at least some proposals of this in my 3K AMA video. There are tons of non-theistic views about the intrinsic nature and character of the foundational or fundamental necessarily existing concrete object. So you could explain existence in terms of any one of, of, of these views. So roughly, I'm going to give maybe 10 here. So first, it could be maybe a collection of very logical symbols. So Matteo Bonucci. Matteo Bonucci. He has, a, he has a PhD thesis published in 2018, and it's called Endurance and Parthood. And it's freely available online. I might have said Benucci. It's Benocci. Matteo Benocci. B-E-N-O-C-C-I. And he defends a view on which the foundation of reality is a collection of enduring meriological symbols. So that, that's an option. That's a non-theistic option. Non option. Again, I'm, I'm going through different non-theistic options here. Maybe 10 or so of them. A second way that you could go is you could say it's a collection of physical symbols, like quarks or superstrings or whatever. A third thing you could say it's one of more fundamental or foundational quantum fields. It could be the universal wave function. So again, I advise people to check out Alyssa Ney and Jill North. They have some excellent work on this. Ney, that's N-E-Y. She has actually a book published in 2021 called The World in the Wave Function, a Metaphysics for Quantum Physics, published with Oxford University Press. So, and there's a huge literature in fossil physics on wave function monism. Okay, th that's the fourth one. The fifth one is the universe as a whole. That might be the foundational necessarily existing concrete object. So one could adopt, for instance, along these lines, Jonathan Schaffer's priority monism. He developed that in a paper, Schaffer 2010, also freely available online. I believe. It's called something like uh, monism, the priority of the whole, or something like that. You can also take a, a sixth view, which is the kind of Oppian initial singularity, which he discusses in his 2013 paper, something like Ultimate Naturalistic Origins, and he's discussed it online. And also, I believe he's going to be discussing it and fleshing it out, uh, maybe perhaps even a whole worldview, uh, in his forthcoming debate book with Kenny Pierce on Is There a God? A Debate. That's very true. Uh, <laughs> so that's a correct prediction. Uh, so that's published with Rutledge. So that's the sixth view. You could have an Oppian initial singularity. The seventh view, you could have the neutral monist substance being the necessary concrete foundation. So that's a neither physicalist nor non-physicalist view. The eighth thing you could have is you could have structure or structural relations being the necessary uh, foundation. Now, this falls in line with ontic structural realism. You guys can check out the Stanford Encyclopedia Philosophy article on structural realism for an introduction to that. But, you know, this is a respectable view in the philosophy of physics uh, and philosophy of science. So that's a kind of ontic structural realism view that you could have a non-theistic view of foundation. Uh, a ninth thing you could have is a, a dynamic physical principle as the ultimate ground. So David Gunn, I believe that's how you pronounce it, he has a 2021 article in the Philosopher's Imprint, available for free online for you guys to read. It's entitled On the Ultimate Origination of Things. And so he gives, he argues that the ultimate ground, the fundamental foundational necessary self-existent object uh, or group of objects, say, uh, are these dynamic physical principles. So definitely check that out. A tenth option is just matter or energy, matter slash energy. You know, you can variously characterize that. Uh, you can also have, say, an impersonal, mindless, absolutely simple, you know, ineffable one. Just this absolute, absolutely simple, impersonal, mindless, it doesn't have knowledge, doesn't have intentions, but it's just this absolutely simple being. You could say it's the pure act of, of being itself. You could say it is pure oneness. You could say it transcends all multiplicity, all complexity, all differentiation, all distinctions whatsoever, including the distinction between the thought and the object of the thought. So it's incapable of thought because that entails some kind of distinction. It's incapable of, you know, being some kind of conscious subject. It's, un it's incapable of intention and so on. I'm not claiming here that this is exactly Plotinus's view, but my point is just that this is a view that one could hold that is very similar to Plotinus's view, but it, you could render it in a perfectly non-theistic way. You could have a non-theistic being itself. You could have a non-theistic, absolutely simple principle, that, which is just necessarily emanates everything, say, or perhaps indeterministically gives rise to everything. And it's just this utter unity, utter oneness with no distinctions whatsoever, no Trinitarian distinctions. No, that would require a cause under this view. Anything with any distinctions whatsoever inside of it would require a cause on this view. Uh, and is independent. Incidentally, this is one reason why I always find it somewhat ironic when for instance, Trinitarian Thomists say like, oh, we have the truly ultimate God, oh. And I'm just like, uh, no, you actually have some kind of inner complexity with respect to the Trinity. Now, of course, they're gonna wanna try to claim that that doesn't entail any parts, set aside whether or not that's true, but it's still at least some sort of multiplicity. You at least have a multiplicity of persons. And then you could just point out that, no, then you don't have something that's truly ultimate. You could go further still, ramp up the ultimateness to like 9,000,
and you'll be able to get to this kind of impersonal Neoplatonic one. Right, because we can equally ask what explains the unity of this multiplicity of persons? Because we can always say that in principle there needs to be some sort of extrinsic principle or extrinsic ground that explains the unity of the multiplicity of these tr Trinitarian persons or whatever. So the truly ultimate view is a kind of atheistic view in which there is this impersonal, absolutely simple Neoplatonic one that is the foundation, the ultimate ground of absolutely everything apart from itself. And you might, of course, say, oh, well, no, I, I, can, I can explain the multiplicity of the Trinitarian persons in terms of something else in God, or maybe in terms of one of those persons, or, or maybe in terms of God as a whole, and so on. But then, of course, you're rendering yourself utterly susceptible to what the non-classical theists can equally then say about their God, or what the naturalists can say about their foundation. Okay, although there's some sort of complexity, maybe even composition within their foundation, uh, there's something within that unified complexity that explains why it's all united together, and so on. So, shout it from the rooftops that Thomists don't actually have an ultimate god. So, yes. Anything with any distinctions whatsoever inside of it would require a cause on this view, uh, in its independent being. So, yeah, so that's another non-theistic view that you could take. So I just went through 11 different non-theistic views of explaining existence in terms of, of one or more necessarily existing foundational objects. So, yeah, and check that stuff out, the articles that I mentioned, and so on. You can also check out three videos of mine where I've discussed the question of you know, ultimate origins and explaining existence. Actually, all of these are in my contingency argument playlist. So, oh, <laughs> look at this pause. <laughs> oh my word. Let's just go forward. There we go. That That's, that's much more uh, aesthetically appealing. Anyway, my point here is just that even if there's an unmoved mover, there are boatloads of non-theistic accounts of what such an unmoved mover could or might be. And indeed, here's something interesting. Some of these even naturalistic accounts, even physicalistic accounts, are compatible with something being purely actual in the sense of, firstly, unchangeable in principle, secondly, being cross-world invariant, so not varying in properties across worlds, and thirdly, being necessarily existent and independent. And so it doesn't have any potencies for change, doesn't have any potencies for cross-world variance, and nor does it have any potencies for existence that could be actualized. And so in that sense, it would at least seem to be purely actual. What view is this? Well, again, it would be versions of that wave function monism defended by people like Alyssa Nay and Jill North that I was talking about. One way that philosophers of physics and literature have conceived of this uh, sui generis physical object, physically described, is that it is a non-spatio-temporal sui generis physical object that is the foundation of everything else. Under this view, space-time would be, in some sense, emergent or at least functionally realized by something more fundamental. So space-time wouldn't be fundamental, and there are actually physical results that suggest as much. And even setting aside the physical results, you can build out a metaphysical worldview on which this thing features as the foundation of reality. Another thing to note is that this principle here, this principle too, that whatever is moved is moved by another, or more accurately, whatever is changed is changed by another, arguably actually entails the thesis of existential inertia, according to which at least some temporal concrete objects persist in existence in the absence of external sustenance and in the absence of sufficiently destructive factors. This principle is essentially saying that whatever is changed is caused to change, or at least whatever is changed is caused to change by another. But of course, contrapose that. That is equivalent to saying that whatever isn't caused to change by another is remaining unchanged. That is the contraposition of it. It's logically equivalent to that. But then once you add that absences don't serve as causes, right? Absences are precisely the absence of something. And so of course, absences cannot serve as causes. In order to cause something, something needs to actually exist, and absences don't exist, right? They're the absence of things that exist. And so absences can't serve as causes, and so the absence of divine sustenance couldn't serve as something that causes, let's say, a temporal concrete object to cease to exist. Now ceasing to exist is it some sort, some kind of change. And so even if there's an absence of divine sustenance, so long as there's an absence of things that could come along and destroy the thing that could cause it to change, it's going to remain unchanged with respect to its existence. And so what that means is that it is going to persist in existence in the absence of things causally inducing its cessation of existence. That is simply logically equivalent to this premise. You might say the absence of divine sustenance is what causes it to cease to exist, right? So we still have whatever changes, and in particular whatever ceases, is caused to cease. But of course, as I pointed out that won't work because absences aren't causes. Absences are precisely the absence of something actual. An absence of something is precisely their not being the thing in question. It's purely negative, and yet causes are something that produces an effect. It needs to be there in order to produce something. And if you deny that, if you say that causes don't need to exist, well, then you could actually just say, uh, oh, no, there is actually some there is actually cause of movement. There is an unmoved mover. There's some sort of uh, cause of motion in things, but it doesn't actually exist. Pick your poison.
I'm just going to give some shout outs firstly to my argument from change playlist. I go over this argument in a lot of depth, as well as the chapters of my forthcoming book with Springer uh, that is co-authored with philosopher of physics Daniel J. Linford. I'm the first author, he's the second author, and it is entitled Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. We have an entire chapter dedicated to Aquinas' first way. We also talk about pluralism about being and so on. And finally, check out the blog post that I have mentioned. But now let's go on to the second cosmological argument, or at least let's hear what Chad says on behalf of this argument. Important for understanding this argument and other arguments which, reje which reject an infinite series is the distinction between a series ordered per se and a series ordered per academics. I've actually covered this in my video on, uh, I have a video, Aquinas's first way and analysis. So I covered that in depth in there. So you can check that out for uh, a description of this. Uh, what Chad says here by way of clarification of the distinction there is not actually relevant to any of my critiques. None of my critiques focus on the distinction between per se and per accident series, and none of them focused on the denial of infinite per se series. All right, let's move on to uh, argument number two, Aquinas's second way. Second way from for the, the existence of an uncaused cause. Some things are caused. Whatever is caused is caused by another. There cannot be an infinite series of causes. Again, that's a series ordered per se. So there must be an uncaused cause. A series ordered per se, very roughly speaking, is a series in which each of the non-first or, or non-fundamental or secondary members wholly derive the relevant causal power. So they don't possess the causal power of themselves, but they rather merely sort of transmit it. They wholly derive it from without. So of course there are interpretive difficulties with respect to all of Aquinas' ways Many suggest that this is actually a version of the Dante argument, and I guess more generally, my response to these sorts of arguments from sustaining causation for the existence of some sort of uncaused cause is going to come in terms of the existential inertia thesis, something that I have already mentioned. One thing in particular that I highly recommend you guys check out if you're curious about exploring existential inertia in more detail is my blog post, which is linked in the description, so you think you understand existential inertia. I go over so many different things, like common mistakes in the debate, the basics of existential inertia, clarifying it, like talking about its scope, its modal register, how it conceives of dependence and destruction, various metaphysical accounts of it, that is, accounts which render persistence non-brute, that gives some kind of principled explanation for why inertially persistent things do in fact persist. So looking at the relationship between existential inertia and relativity theory, give a rigorous articulation of existential inertia, of course. I flesh out the metaphysics of existential inertia in much more depth, these various accounts, which pinpoint that in virtue of which it obtains, or explaining why inertially persistent things persist. And of course, various motivations for existential inertia, as well as arguments against it in the literature, and I go over these in tremendous detail. And you can also find the resources at the end of that. But anyway, we're not going to spend too much detail on it. Uh, I would just say that if this argument is sort of demanding that, let's say, either composite things or non-god things or things in which essence and existence are distinct or so on if they require some sort of sustaining cause, you will be able to level existential inertia as a defeater of that. Whether it's a rebutting defeater, that is giving some positive reason to think that a relevant premise is false, or an undercutting defeater, that is um, showing why a relevant premise is insufficiently or inadequately motivated, that's going to depend on the dialectical context. And the next thing I'm going to say is that this conclusion is, again, extremely limited, right? It's not going to get you to God. Naturalists can easily accept that there's some sort of uncaused cause, and we've already seen boatloads of non-theist-friendly first causes. But in any case, let's continue. All right, Aquinas' third way. Why don't I read this one? Because there's a lot to read here. Yeah, I'm actually going to take this off the screen so that uh, people can see <clears throat> all of the, the text here. So uh, premise number one, whatever is contingent at one time did not exist. If everything is contingent, then at one time nothing existed. If at one time nothing existed, then nothing would exist now. Something does exist now. So not every being is contingent. So there is a necessary being. Uh, premise seven, either the necessary being gets its necessity from another or exists necessarily of itself. Premise eight, there cannot be an infinite regress of necessary beings that get their necessity from another. And then the conclusion, so there is a necessary being that exists necessarily of itself. So uh, premise number one, whatever is contingent at one time did not exist. If everything is contingent, then at one time nothing existed. If at one time nothing existed, then nothing would exist now. Something does exist now. So not every being is contingent. So there is a necessary being. Uh, premise seven, either the necessary being gets its necessity from another or exists necessarily of itself. Premise eight, cannot be an infinite regress of necessary beings that get their necessity from another. And then the conclusion, so there is a necessary being that exists necessarily of itself. So the first thing to say here is, of course, to check out my video on Aquinas' third way. I actually go into a pretty in-depth analysis on what Aquinas means by contingent and necessary, and I give a variety of criticisms of the argument. But here's the too long didn't read, or I guess too long didn't watch. 
So premise one is very probably false, uh, and at the very least unmotivated. Yes, I know that Aquinas understood contingent and necessary differently than we do, but at least as contemporary philosophers use the word contingent, it means can fail to exist. But of course, something that can fail to exist, that doesn't entail that at one time in the actual world, it does not in fact exist. It could, for instance, just exist at all moments of time, and yet still be such that it is possibly absent from reality, although not actually absent from some time or other. So one way of interpreting Aquinas on contingency with respect to the third way is that contingent things have a kind of built-in tendency or disposition uh, toward decay, something along those lines. But even so, I still claim that premise one, even under that understanding, is very probably false. Even if something has a disposition or a tendency toward decay, dispositions and tendencies require manifestation conditions to be met. Dispositions and tendencies are only manifested if their manifestation conditions are met. So, for instance, a match has a disposition or tendency to produce heat and flame rather than, say, cold and the smell of lilacs. But, of course, it's only going to manifest that disposition or tendency if its manifestation conditions are met. If, for instance, it's not wet around the environment, we're in a relatively dry environment with enough oxygen, and if the match is struck against the side of the matchbox or whatever, those conditions need to be in place in order for that disposition or tendency toward heat and flame to become actual or to be actualized. And uh, merely from the fact that something has such a disposition or tendency toward, say, decay, it doesn't follow that at one time it will not or did not exist. Because again, it might not be the case that those conditions were met. All right, so premise one, again, is, is very probably false. Premise two, I also think, is very probably false, uh, and at the very least, again, unmotivated. Even if we grant that everything contingent at one time does not exist, it doesn't follow that there would be some one time such that every contingent thing doesn't exist at that time. Imagine a following scenario. Let's just suppose that 14 billion years ago, the first contingent thing came into existence. Now suppose that that contingent thing lasted for 10 seconds. And then at the end of that 10 seconds, another contingent thing came into existence. And then af after that, after 10 seconds had transpired, a still further contingent thing came into existence. And so on, and so on, throughout the past, up until the present. Now, in this case, we have everything being contingent and... Now, in this case, everything that's contingent is such that, at one time, it did not exist. Now, in this case, it's true that everything contingent is such that, at some time, it doesn't exist. But there isn't some single time at which nothing contingent exists. It's still the case that at every time, something contingent or other exists. So, even if everything is contingent, and even if we grant, as we shouldn't, that whatever is contingent at some time does not exist, you simply cannot confer that there is some one single time at which nothing contingent exists. The final thing that I will say with respect to this argument is that the conclusion, again, doesn't get you to God. Naturalists can easily accept that there's a necessarily existent foundational concrete object, uh, foundational in the sense of it doesn't have its existence or even its necessity from some more fundamental concrete object. And again, I've already gone through various different proposals for that, so we don't need to belabor the point here. Let's now move on to cosmological argument number four. Where can people go to find out more about Aquinas' uh, five ways? Like, what's a good resource for that? You know, I struggled with this. I, did, I didn't really come up with a good source. Uh, Anthony Kenny has a good book on Aquinas' five ways. I mean, you, you, you mentioned Ed Fazer here. Ed Fazer is Fazer, you know, mean, he, Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for a defense of Aquinas on anything, Fazer is pretty much just as good of a source as any other. Uh, <clears throat> okay, well, uh, that's, that's probably not true. But if you want a high-level source for these sorts of... If you want a high-level source for investigating Aquinas' various arguments further, as well as Aquinas' metaphysics, check out John Whipple's work. That's W-I-P-P-E-L. For instance, you could go to Whipple's The Metaphysical Thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's technical. It's definitely not an introduction. So if you want an introduction, yeah, I'd go with this. But just be aware that the arguments that Fazer presents in here are very implausible and succumb to various objections. But of course, since you are a viewer of Majesty of Reason, you already know that. So let's continue. Uh, is it Antoinette Gilson? He's he's pretty darn it's, good. It's Etienne, not Antoinette. It's a minor point. And I think it, that's that's probably French, right? So it's probably Etienne Gilson or something like that. So <laughs> Good on the five ways. There are actually philosophers who are starting to defend versions of the five ways that don't appeal to some of the more Aristotelian concepts that Aquinas assumes. One of them being my one of my advisors, PhD advisor, Scott McDonald. I think he's got a paper called Aquinas' parasitic cosmological argument, where it's, it's, a, it's an extended defense of the first way, um, uh, using contemporary physics. No, that's just straight out false. Scott McDonald published a paper 
called Aquinas' Parasitic Cosmological Argument. Therein he argues that the first way fails, and that it's parasitic, that it could only succeed if it relies on some other arguments in Aquinas' work. He argues that the first way fails. Firstly, he doesn't go into modern physics and how it relates to that, or he doesn't update the argument in terms of physics. So here is Aquinas' parasitic cosmological argument. This is actually a very good article, and I interact and cite it heavily in my uh, forthcoming manuscript, Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. But basically, he's saying, like, yeah, there has been some neglect of Aquinas' ways in recent times. One reason is that people think that it has certain devastating criticisms, among which it crucially depends on a kind of Aristotelian physical theory or ancient cosmology. And what Scott McDonald points points out is that those objections actually don't really work. You can free the argument from the trappings of ancient science and astrology. He defends it against the most common philosophical criticisms of it from, for instance, Anthony Kenny. But, of course, after defending the argument against some of those well-known criticisms that are misguided, he argues that it still fails, and in particular it fails as an independent proof of God's existence, because it depends on other arguments in Aquinas' corpus. And he says commentators haven't adequately appreciated this, the parasitical nature of it. That's why it's called Aquinas' parasitic cosmological argument. It fails on its own to show that God exists. That's what he's arguing. He doesn't update it in light of modern science. He points out that the argument really was never in the first place resting on, for instance, ancient science and cosmology like Aristotelian physics. Let's move on to, uh, all right, argument number four, Samuel Clark. And I haven't heard of this one, so I'm really curious. Like, just I guess I'll let you read this one, and then uh, sure. I, I may ask a question or two about it. So a, a, an important distinction for this argument is the distinction between contingent things and dependent things. N Everything that's contingent is dependent, but not everything that's dependent is contingent. I like so that. This yeah, so it's good to have these conceptually distinct in our mind, but we should at least note that it's highly controversial that everything that's contingent is dependent. I myself at least am tentatively inclined to be sympathetic to that because I'm sympathetic to certain restricted versions of the principle of sufficient reason. In general, I tend to think that contingent things depend on other things, but Lots of philosophers aren't down with that. They aren't sympathetic to that. And they reject that every single contingent thing whatsoever is dependent on another. It requires something else to explain why it exists. Something is contingent just in case it exists in some possible worlds, but not all possible worlds. So it exists in some, but it doesn't exist in others. By contrast, something is necessary just in case it exists in all possible worlds. Uh, that is, it cannot fail to exist, whereas a contingent thing can fail to exist. And a possible world is just a total or complete or global way that reality could be. This argument says, um, we don't even need to talk about contingent things. All we need to do is focus on dependent things. And the argument's off and running. And like, in everyday language, when someone hears the word contingent, they're probably thinking of it in the dependence yes, way. Yes, that's you know a what good mean? point. So it was a that is a very good point. It's unfortunate, right? Because philosophers use it in a different way. And that, that has caused so much confusion on the internet and everywhere. And it's very sad. And even sometimes philosophers get confused on this. So... Yeah, it's it's very unfortunate. So there are dependent beings. For any dependent being, it either depends on itself or it depends on another. Nothing can depend on itself. So all dependent things depend on another. The series of dependent beings which depend on another can't be infinite. If the series of beings which depend on another can't be infinite, then the series of beings which depend on another must ultimately depend on an independent being. So the series of beings which depend on another must ultimately depend on an independent being. So for me, it's unclear whether premise 5 is true, that the series of beings which depend on another cannot be infinite. The relevant notion of dependence here is either synchronic, like at one time, one thing is kind of deriving its existence from something else that is kind of sustaining it, or else it's diachronic. So something brought the thing into existence in the first place, but then thereafter, it kind of continues on of its own steam, as it were. Now... If the relevant notion of dependence at play here is synchronic, then I think this argument is going to be susceptible to a kind of existential inertialist style critique. At least some contingent things may very well be such that they're only dependent in a diachronic sense, not in a synchronic sense. And so you wouldn't be able to get to a kind of concurrent foundation of reality if you're using this argument, some kind of concurrent thing that sustains other things upon which the contingent things depend. And I know we're not talking about contingent here. I should just say dependent things depend. Now, by contrast, if we're talking about a diachronic chain, so maybe one thing was brought into existence 10 years ago, and that thing that brought it into existence, maybe that thing was brought in still further 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and so on. Uh, but it's not clear, at least to me, why there couldn't be an infinite regress of that kind. After all, each member in the series isn't wholly deriving its existence or even its causal power from without. You might, of course, appeal to causal finitism or maybe certain Kalam-style arguments, but then you no longer have an independent argument here. This isn't an argument in its own right. It's going to be parasitic on uh, the Kalam argument, which is another argument in the list. So um, this argument would then fail as an independent argument in its own right.
We should also at least be wary of another potential quantifier shift problem. So again, even if each particular series of beings which depend on another must be finite, such that each particular series of dependent beings terminates in at least one independent being, it doesn't follow that there is some one single independent being that all dependent beings trace back to as its source or its foundation in some sense. That would be an obvious quantifier shift fallacy, merely from the fact that each person has a mother, it doesn't follow that there is some single mother of all people. And similarly, merely from the fact that each chain is such that it has a first member, it doesn't follow that there is some first independent member for all such chains, that all such chains trace back to. And what that means is that all we have here is like at least one independent being, maybe there are boatloads of them. Moreover, we can't even conclude that this independent being is necessary unless we add a further premise in here that every contingent thing is dependent. And of course, at least lots of non-theists are going to reject that because they're going to reject the kind of PSR that that is expressing. But also lots of non-theists aren't going to reject that, so that's fine. Abi, for instance, wouldn't reject it, I wouldn't reject it, and lots of other non-theists wouldn't reject that. That brings us to the third point that I want to make here, which is just that the conclusion doesn't get you to God at all. Again, the naturalist can easily accept it. Even a naturalist who thinks that the foundation is contingent can accept that conclusion. But again, if even if we added that premise that everything contingent depends on another, so that the independent thing or things, collection of things, would have to be necessary, you're still going to be very, very, very far away from God, given the whole concoction of naturalist-friendly, necessarily existent concrete foundations that I specified earlier on in the video. A Clark's classic uh, demonstration, uh, William Rowe, Richard Gale, and Bruce Reichenbach. Reichenbach. If you guys, so we're going to run through some of these really quickly. So if you, when you see these resources, these, these resource slides, pause the video and then like jot down whatever you want, because I can't, I can't like put everything in the description of this video, all the different resources, because there's actually a limited amount of, uh, of space. But can you believe, and we're already like hitting some really heavy philosophy here. Like I said, these are not like, this is not your brother's argument that he like came up when he was five years old and was trying to share it with his other friend when they were just randomly debating God's existence. So th these are very, very serious. I guess <laughs> oh, those five-year-olds who are debating God's existence. I love it. Start them early. Some of these arguments, like they weren't in this form, right? They weren't like deductive and, and, and like a syllogism like this or, or like a structured uh, yeah, deductive form. So That's you right. had to do a lot of that work yourself. So uh, this is actually this is a huge resource. Process. This is a huge resource. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, so just, uh, why don't I read this one? Cause you read the last one. All right. So here it is. Leibniz's cosmological argument. CA just means cosmological argument. We're, we're going to have to use some abbreviations here. All right. Uh, premise number one, anything that exists has a sufficient reason for why it exists either in another contingent being or in a necessary being. Number two, the world exists. Three, therefore, the world has a sufficient reason for why it exists, either in another contingent being or in a necessary being. But the sufficient reason for why the world exists cannot be in another contingent being, since A, the world just is the collection of all contingent beings, and B, the sufficient reason for the collection cannot be in its parts, individually or collectively. So, a sufficient reason for the world must be a necessary being outside the world. And the conclusion, therefore, there is a necessary being outside the world. So... Premise one is deeply, deeply questionable, and it might depend on how we cash out sufficient reason. So I take it here that we just mean some kind of adequate explanation for why something exists, or at least some sort of explanation. We can understand explanation in at least two different senses. One is a sense of mystery removal, right? So that's a kind of more epistemic sense. In this sense, an explanation of some fact or object or phenomenon is something that removes mystery as to why that fact or phenomenon obtains or exists. So it kind of removes mystery, it removes puzzlement. So that's a kind of epistemic sense. It's kind of relative to what we find puzzling and uh, what we find mysterious and whether or not something can satisfactorily remove that or at least mitigate it. By contrast, and this is the kind of explanation that I'm more interested in, it's a more metaphysical notion of explanation. And that would be maybe some extra mental or mind independent feature of or fact about something being due to or coming from something else. It's a kind of relation of dependence in some form or another. So causation might be one such relation, but there are going to be other relations. You might have functional realization. So in some sense, the hardware as well as the various inputs and outputs and rules by which the hardware is working might functionally realize a certain program. And that might be an explanation as to why the program exists. So we have causation, we have functional realization, we have grounding style explanations. So perhaps the structure of various atoms and subatomic particles ground the structure of DNA and its various functions. So that would be a grounding style explanation and so on. Again, this is not an exhaustive or comprehensive list of the various different explanatory relations that might structure reality. But my point is just that we need to be careful to distinguish an epistemic sense of explanation as mystery removal and a metaphysical sense of explanation as some kind of mind-independent dependence of one thing on another or another's. Another's? What the? 
<laughs> okay. But anyway, back to what I was saying. So the reason why I think premise one is questionable is because I think even under both of those understandings or senses of explanation, I just tend to think that self-explanation is incoherent. Nothing can explain itself. I certainly think that this is pretty clear in the metaphysical sense. I mean, something would somehow have to depend on itself. It would have to be both prior to and posterior to itself, which seems absurd. It would either have to cause itself or ground itself or somehow functionally realize itself. But of course, then it would in some sense already have to be there. It would already have to exist in order to have that relevant explanatory power, in order to have that causal power or grounding power or whatever. And so it would be both prior to itself and posterior to itself, which to my mind just doesn't make any sense. And even in the epistemic sense, I mean, if I ask, why does something exist? And you respond, oh, because it exists. I'm just going to think maybe you misunderstood my question. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you have a stroke. Maybe you're a new atheist, which is kind of synonymous, I guess, with being confused. That was a joke. And note, I didn't say an atheist. I said a new atheist, okay? There's a distinction there. But again, you're not explaining anything if I ask, why is P true? Why? Why is that? And you just say, oh, because P is true. Like, you're just... I asked you why P is true. Give me some account. Give me some illumination. Explain to me why it's true. Don't just reiterate back to me because it's true. But yet that's precisely what self-explanation is. You have P explaining P. Or in the case of an object, you have X explaining X. It, to my mind, it doesn't even make sense in the case of the epistemic sense of explanation. And if that's the case, well, then it's false that anything that exists has a sufficient reason for why it exists or every fact has a sufficient reason. Because if self-explanation doesn't make any sense, well then, for any given case of explanation, you're going to have one thing being explained by another, being explained by another, being explained by another, and so on ad infinitum. Now, the only way you can avoid that kind of ad infinitum extension of the explanatory links within this chain is if the, the chain kind of wraps back around on itself. But then, of course, you'd have a circular style explanation, which ultimately amounts to a kind of self-explanation, right? You've a explaining B, explaining C, eventually going around to explaining A. And in that case, A is part of the explanation of why it is the case that A. And we've already ruled out self-explanation as incoherent. And so you're going to get this huge infinite chain of explanatory links within a chain. Now, we can then just ask, why is there that chain? Of course, you can't appeal to anything within the chain because we're asking why there is that chain at all in the first place. You know, if I ask why are there, let's say, any trees at all in the first place, it's no use responding because there's a tree. You're appealing to something within the very thing I'm trying to ask, like, why that's there at all. And so the whole infinitude of the chain would then be unexplained. And so it would be false that everything has a sufficient reason for why it exists. Now, of course, you might say, oh, well, that whole infinite chain is itself explained. But then, of course, you're positing another infinite chain, and then we can just focus on the whole shebang, right? But anyway, my point is just that I think we have to restrict the PSR in some manner or another. Maybe we're going to restrict it to contingent things. Maybe we're going to restrict it to whatever. But since premise one is not so restricted, it says anything that exists has a sufficient reason for why it exists, I think that I would probably reject premise one. Premise two, moreover, is highly questionable. What is the world? Now, down here we get uh, a definition. It's the collection of all contingent beings. But then why would we say that the collection of contingent beings itself exists? Why should we ontologically commit to collections? What, is there some collection of, like, let's say me, my laptop, you, the Eiffel Tower, Donald Trump's left ear, your left big toe, and my phone, I I as well as Hillary Clinton? Is there that collection? Okay, maybe there's the set, right? But we're not talking about sets here. We're not talking about abstract objects. So what is this collection? It's a very strange and spooky object indeed. So I'm actually quite skeptical that the world exists. Sure, maybe each of those individual contingent things exist. And indeed, maybe there's the set containing them. But what is this collection of them? Why should I think that that exists? So anyway, premise two is also highly questionable. And it seems to lead to various implausibilities, as I've been pointing out. Hume, of course, would reject 4b as well. He'd say that, no, you can explain why there is that collection by citing just the parts of the collection. I myself, I don't know, I don't really find that all that plausible. I mean, for starters, you can focus on it like a cannonball, right? You can divvy up the times in such a way that you have a fully internal explanation uh, linking each second to a preceding half second, to a preceding quarter of a second, to a preceding eighth of a second. So you can explain, in some sense, the trajectory of the cannonball just by focusing on, like, the snapshot moment right after it was shot, right? And each member of that series is going to be explained with reference to a preceding member. So the velocity and the position and the character of trajectory at any given point is going to be explained by reference to another point within that interval. But of course, even though each member is explained, 
you still haven't explained why there is that whole trajectory in the first place. And of course, there is an explanation of that, and you have to go outside of the particular series. You have to go to the chem which actually fired it in the first place. Moreover, you can focus on explaining types of things, and Hume wouldn't be able to answer and Hume wouldn't be able to cite certain tokens of that type to explain why there are any tokens of that type in the first place. Again, because that would be a kind of circular explanation. Another thing that I would say is that the conclusion here doesn't get you to God, right? Naturalists can easily accept it. Outside of this world is misleading, right? In some sense, it suggests that it's like, oh, it transcends the universe or something. Maybe it's spaceless and timeless, you know, it's some sort of transcendent being. But no, remember, the world is just here defined as the collection of all contingent beings. So all you're saying when you're saying that it's outside of the world is you're just saying that it's necessary. It's not among the collection of contingent things. This should really be crossed off because it's suggesting something that might look suspiciously more like God than we're actually able to get out. Outside the world just is equivalent in this context to being a necessary being. So I think this should be crossed out. And of course, we've already seen how there are boatloads of naturalist friendly accounts of what a necessary foundational concrete being could be. So anyway, Again, we don't really have an argument for God here. We have an argument for a necessary foundation. But of course, it's an entirely separate question whether that necessary foundation is God. And there are panoplies of workable, naturalist-friendly proposals of what a necessary foundation could be. So again, this argument is not a successful argument for God's existence. None of them thus far have been. It's going to be a recurring theme, by the way. It's four. And... This was David Hume's objection to the argument. He thought that this argument, premise four in particular, committed the fallacy of composition. Uh, if each part is contingent, why should we think that the whole is contingent? If each part of an engine weighs, I don't know, a pound, that, that doesn't follow that the engine weighs a pound. The engine is going to be a lot heavier than just a pound. But now, compare a different example. Uh, if each part of the wall, each brick of the wall is red, it does follow that the wall is red. So the question is, is contingency like color, or is it more like weight? And, uh, well, I think it's more like color, right? It's not like weight. A bunch of contingent things together don't add up their contingency to be like more contingency in the way in the same way that something lightweight things don't add up their weight to be more heavy right you don't get something that's more contingent just by adding up contingent things so another another way of objecting would be if each part has an explanation uh why think the whole must have an explanation and here uh here are a few a few examples to to think that if we've explained each part that's not sufficient for explaining the whole richard gale has, has this charming example i'm modifying a little bit Imagine what, what Chad is about to argue, and again, even if his argument succeeds, what he's arguing for is the conclusion that explaining all the parts of something is not by itself sufficient. That is, it doesn't guarantee an explanation for the whole. But notice that Hume can respond by saying, yeah, but sure, that might be true in some cases, right? Explaining all the parts doesn't thereby explain the whole. But maybe in some other cases, explaining all the parts does sufficiently explain the whole. Maybe if you are able to explain why each individual pebble is as it is on the sidewalk, you've thereby explained why all the pebbles are there together as they are on the sidewalk. So even if you can come up with some situations in which explaining the parts isn't sufficient for explaining the whole, it's an entirely separate question whether this extends to absolutely all cases of explaining the parts and that explanation transferring to an explanation of the whole. So that's something that Hume could push back here. So uh, even if Chad is able to give certain examples that show that it's not by itself sufficient, that doesn't automatically generalize to absolutely every case of explaining parts and wholes. It could be the case that, in principle, sometimes when you explain the parts, you don't thereby explain the whole, but other times you do have an explanation for the whole when you simply explain the parts. And nothing in Chad's argument that he's about to give rules that out, which he would need to do if he wants to give a successful response to the criticism in question. Again, you can go back and forth and back and forth on these sorts of things. I think probably the best move is just to focus on explaining why there are any tokens of a given type at all, ever. So you could focus on the type being a contingent concrete object. Why are there any tokens of that type at all, ever? And you're simply not going to be able to explain that in terms of some contingent concrete object, because that would be a patently circular explanation. We are asking why there is any such thing at all in the first place. So you can't appeal to that very thing. So that's probably the best move for the theist at this juncture, at least for the defender of Leibniz's cosmological argument. That there are five philosophers on that, if we've explained each part, that's not sufficient for explaining the whole. Richard Gale has, has this charming example. I'm modifying a little bit. Imagine that there are five philosophers on a particular street corner in New York City, and we want to know why there are five philosophers on this particular street corner in New York City. Well, one of them is there because his grandma lives around the block, and he's going to see her. One is there because he's on the way to see a play. One is there because he just wanted to get outside and get some fresh air. One is there, because, and so on. So they each have their own individual reason for being on that street corner. 
that by itself doesn't explain why there are five philosophers on this street corner. That seems to that seems to cry out for more explanation. And the explanation there would be, oh, there's a meeting of the American Philosophical Association happening in New York City on this weekend. Uh, you see how that works? So there's something a little bit deeper. Yeah, there's there's got to be yeah. some extra explanation for it. Yeah. Yeah. So Alexander Proust gives a different example. He, he asks us to imagine imagine a cannonball at rest at noon. Yeah. So this is the example that I was giving earlier. So we can ask, why is a cannonball moving one minute past noon? Well, because it was moving a half a minute past noon. Again, even in that case, even in the example that I gave, and again, I'm sort of responding to the point that I made earlier, uh, this is just one example of how, in some cases, you don't thereby explain the whole by simply explaining each of the parts. It doesn't show that this is true for absolutely every case. But if that's true, then why was it moving a half a minute past noon? Well, because it was moving a, a, a quarter minute past noon. Why was it moving a quarter minute past noon? Well, because it was moving an eighth minute past noon. So why is it moving at any time past noon is the question. So even if it's movement at any one time is explained by a prior time, it doesn't explain why the, the cannonball is moving at all. We need to eventually recourse to the fact that it was fired. So those are two examples of, of how, even if we have an explanation of a part, that doesn't necessarily mean we have an explanation of the whole. So we have a Leibnizian cosmological argument that's defended by Stephen Davis and, and, and Bill Craig. Everything yeah. that exists has an explanation. The universe exists, so the universe has an explanation. If the universe has an explanation, it's God, so God exists. The key premise there is four, which he points out is... Well, let's just pause it there. So firstly, given what I said earlier, I'm quite skeptical of self-explanation. And of course, if you're not able to have self-explanation, if you're not able to have these kinds of circular explanations where one entity somehow explains why it itself exists or some proposition or fact explains why it itself obtains or is true then that first premise is going to end up being false. So I'm going to say that pre premise is deeply contentious and arguably false, given the reasons that I gave earlier against circular explanation or against self-explanation. We should, of course, also note that lots of philosophers, including theists, are not going to accept the first premise, that everything that exists has an explanation. This is expressing a generalized PSR, which we should at least note is monumentally contentious within metaphysics and philosophy of religion. That said, I'm not going to challenge it here. Now, a technical nitpick is on premise two. One might think that the universe as some sort of concrete object in itself doesn't exist. One might think that, yes, various spatiotemporal things exist, but is there some one thing which is like the sum of them all or the collection of them all that is somehow the universe? It's questionable. That doesn't really matter too much because you could probably just modify this in saying everything that exists or at least every collection of things that exist have an explanation. And then you could just say, well, the universe either exists or at the very least it's a collection of things that exist. So you could probably go that route and uh, that would be a way to salvage the argument and to dispense with ontological commitment to this entity called the universe. So we could set that criticism aside. And then premise four, I think, is just I'm trying to find nice things to say here, but I just find it utterly ludicrous, to be honest. It doesn't follow from the fact that the universe has an explanation, that that explanation is God. That's just a blatant non sequitur, and I think the premise is just patently false. Again, I went through boatloads of explanations earlier that could explain why there is the collection of, let's say, the spatiotemporal things that there are. It could be in terms of any number of those naturalistic concrete foundations. Each of those provide an explanation for why the universe exists. Some of them adduce something within the universe being metaphysically necessary and explaining all the contingent things within the universe. Some of them say that the universe itself would be metaphysically necessary rather than there being something within the universe, say a quantum field or a collection of fundamental particles being necessary. Still, other explanations cite something outside the universe, but which isn't at all God. It could be some kind of impersonal Neoplatonic one. It could be the non-spatiotemporal universal wave function that people like Alyssa Ney and Jill North and various other philosophers have explored within the context of philosophy of physics. It could be boatloads of things. It could just be some sort of timeless quantum state or some sort of quantum entity. It could be a whole concoction of things that have nothing to do with God. And so premise four, I genuinely think it's ludicrous. The universe has an explanation. It's God, so God exists. The key premise there is four, which he points out is logically equivalent to what the atheist has always maintained, which is that if God does not exist, the universe has no explanation. It's just proved. So <laughs> what the atheist has always maintained, that is just, that is truly ludicrous. What is this supposed the atheist? W what are you talking about? Sure, perhaps some atheists in the history of thought have maintained that. Yes, okay, cool. But some atheists in the history of thought have also denied that. No traction is made in this dispute by saying, oh, the atheist has always maintained this. This is this is just ludicrous. That is not a justification for the premise. Pretty strong argument. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. Uh. okay. And let's move on to uh, some resources for that one. Stephen T. Davis, Cosmological Argument and the Epistemic Status of Belief in God.
and Wayland Craig's reasonable faith. Yeah, he's defended that one. I would in, say uh, it is an exceedingly and perhaps embarrassingly weak argument, but let's continue. A lot of his works, he's defended that one. Yeah. So, all right, uh, moving on. So now we are on to uh, argument number seven. Proust, the Leibnizian argument from Alexander Proust. And I'll read this one because I just mm-hmm. have such an affinity for Alexander Proust. All right, number one is every contingent fact has an explanation. Number two, there is a contingent fact that includes all other contingent facts. Number three, therefore, there is an explanation of this fact. Four, this explanation cannot itself be a contingent fact. And then the conclusion, so the explanation of all contingent facts is necessary. What's- so the first thing to say here is that I actually have a video dedicated expressly to this argument. I went through in depth Proust's chapter in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. It was more so an expository video, but there was also some examination interlaced with it. So definitely check out that video. I'm very proud of it. I put in so much work to that video. I think it's called the Leibnizian Cosmological Argument or something. It's in my contingency argument playlist. But premise two here, I think, is false. And uh, I'm actually quite confident that it's false. There is no such contingent fact that includes all other contingent facts. Proust treats a fact as a true proposition. So this is saying that every contingent true proposition has an explanation. Then there is essentially a BCCF, a big conjunctive contingent fact, or big conjunctive contingent true proposition. And that is a contingent proposition, which is a conjunction, whose conjuncts are all and only contingent propositions. So this is the contingent fact or contingent true proposition that includes all other contingent facts or contingent true propositions. But there cannot be a BCCF, and this is argued quite forcefully in this paper published in Philosophia, published in 2016 by Christopher Tomaszewski. It's called The Principle of Sufficient Reason Defended. There is no conjunction of all contingently true propositions. So there cannot be such a BCCF. There cannot be a contingent fact that includes all other contingent facts. So I just want to go through some of his reasoning here. So I just want to give you the rough idea of what Christopher argues in this paper. So he's attacking Peter Van Inwagen's argument that the principle of sufficient reason entails modal collapse or entails necessitarianism, according to which absolutely every truth is a necessary truth and every object is a necessarily existing object. And what Tomaszewski argues is that one critical flaw in his argument lies in his assumption that there is such a thing as the conjunction of all contingently true propositions. This is shown to follow from Cantor's theorem and a property of conjunction with respect to contingent propositions. Of course, one point Christopher makes, and I think this is an accurate point, the PSR by itself doesn't entail modal collapse, it doesn't entail necessitarianism, and Van Inwagen's argument fails just even on this front. The principal reason is that there can be explanations that don't necessitate what is being explained. In other words, that there can be explanations that don't strictly entail or determine or deterministically explain the fact to be explained. So one way to see this is just in terms of probabilistic explanations. If I flip a coin, let's say it's a fair coin and it has a 50% chance of landing heads and a 50% chance of landing tails. It's no surprise on a given occasion that it lands heads. Of course, we don't have a deterministic explanation of why it lands heads, let's say, and we don't have an explanation of why it lands heads rather than tails. But we can still give a non-deterministic, non-necessitating explanation as to why it landed heads. We can talk about the constitution of the coin, how it has two different sides, and how given the initial conditions and so on, it could have landed on one of the two sides, this is one of the alternatives, and it just so happened that it landed on this one. We're not going to be able to explain again why it landed on on the heads rather than tails in this case, but we can still cite factors that are explanatorily relevant to it landing heads. It isn't utterly inexplicable why it landed heads, because again, we can still cite facts about the constitution of the coin, the way that it's made, the initial conditions, and so on. Similarly, if someone asks why I went to go get a drink, and the reason is because, well, I am thirsty, that doesn't strictly entail that I'm going to go get a drink. After all, I might have had an even stronger desire to stay still. But nevertheless, it is explanatorily relevant. It does at least offer some kind of explanation as to why I went to get a drink. It's not a deterministic explanation. Maybe it's not even a full or complete explanation, but it still offers at least some kind of explanation as to why I went to get a drink. Okay, so let's set aside that assumption, though, and the assumption that Christopher is attacking is this first assumption. Let P be the conjunction of all contingently true propositions. This assumes that there is, or even could be, such a conjunction of all contingently true propositions. But the problem is that there are too many contingently true propositions to be formed into some kind of collection or some kind of conjunction. And you can basically show this with Cantor's theorem, which is a pretty logically unassailable aspect of math, of set theory. So here is Christopher's argument, and again, we're just going to be kind of brief here. I just want to give you guys a sense of what it's like. So he assumes for reductio that there is a conjunction of all contingently true propositions P. Here's the key premise. For each non-empty collection of propositions which are conjuncts of P, 
there is a unique, contingently true proposition to which it corresponds. Then it follows from 1 that every such contingently true proposition is a conjunct of P. 4. From Cantor's theorem, you can actually conclude that there are strictly more non-empty collections of propositions which are conjuncts of P than there are propositions which are conjuncts of P. You can kind of see why this is an analog of Cantor's theorem with respect to sets. So uh, Cantor's theorem with respect to sets says that if you have a given set S, the size or cardinality of the set of all the subsets of S is strictly greater than the size or cardinality of S itself. That is, there are more subsets of S than there are members of S. That's what Cantor's theorem says. And if you think about it a little bit, you'll see why this is pretty much a corollary of that. And so from 2, 3, and 4, you get that there are strictly more propositions which are conjuncts of P than there are propositions which are conjuncts of P. That follows from 2, 3, and 4. But of course, that's absurd, right? <laughs> You're saying there are more propositions which are conjuncts of P than there are propositions which are conjuncts of P. That's like saying there are more apples on the table than there are apples on the table. No. No. <laughs> okay, so we conclude by reductio that there is no conjunction of all contingently true propositions. So our assumption for reductio is false. And again, two is the key premise. Four is, again, just an unassailable mathematical fact. And one is assumed for reductio. The rest just follow. So premise two is to see why it's true, says Tomachevsky, we begin by noting that if just one contingently true proposition is a conjunct of another true proposition, then that latter proposition is also contingently true. Now, let x, I think that might be, a, what is that, is that a chi or something like that? Oh well, I'm just going to say x. Now let x be some such collection of conjuncts from p, and let c sub x be the conjunction of all the propositions in this collection. Now consider c sub x and n, where n is an arbitrary necessary proposition. This conjunction will have the following form, c1, and c2, and c3, and c4, and so on, and n. In this conjunction, each c sub i is a proposition belonging to the collection in question, and n is any necessary proposition one might like, for example, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, or the law of non-contradiction. Now, we can see that c sub x and n is exactly the proposition which we have been seeking. It is a contingently true proposition, and it's unique for each collection c sub x. Additionally, the inclusion of n in the conjunction ensures that c sub x and n is not logically equivalent to any conjunction of atomic propositions in P, and therefore must be included in P if it really is to be the conjunction of all contingently true propositions. So basically what Christopher has shown here is he's shown a procedure for finding a unique contingently true proposition that we can correspond to every collection of conjuncts from the big conjunctive contingent fact, P. And so basically what we've shown is that for each non-empty collection of propositions which are conjuncts of P, we can construct a unique contingently true proposition to which it corresponds, and that establishes premise two. Okay, anyway, check out this article if you are interested in it further. I know that's probably, that's, this is going to be the most complicated portion of this video, so sorry about that, but uh, we're back. We are back to the normal stuff now. So anyway, my point here, no, premise two is false. There is no such contingent fact that includes all of the contingent facts. As Proust articulates it in his article, as Proust articulates it in the article that this argument is based on, a contingent fact is just a contingently true proposition. And so this is committing to a BCCF, a big conjunction of contingently true propositions. And there cannot be such a thing, because there are too many contingent propositions to be able to form a collection like that. You can show that via Cantor's theorem. Another thing to note is that this conclusion, again, it doesn't get you anywhere near God. The naturalist can easily accept absolutely every single one of these premises, although they shouldn't accept two, of course, because it's false. But the naturalist can accept all of these premises. And I've already gone through various proposals that the naturalist can use for a necessary concrete foundation or collection of objects within the foundation um, of reality. And also, just for kicks and giggles, the PSR doesn't entail modal collapse as we've seen. That's a typical objection to the PSR. Another typical objection to the PSR is that quantum mechanics falsifies it. No, in quantum mechanics we have indeterministic explanations of things. The various indeterministic phenomena that you see in quantum mechanics, like maybe a particle goes through the right slit as opposed to the left slit and there's no explanation to why it goes in one rather than another, so there's no deterministic explanation of why it goes in one, there's no necessitating explanation of why it goes in one, but there is still clearly, there's still clearly an explanation of why it goes in one. If there were no explanation at all, then you wouldn't be able to get this kind of consistently regular uniform manifestation of different chances by which it goes through one or the other. You wouldn't be able to get, calculate certain precise probabilities that it'll go through one one as opposed to the other. The very fact that there's regularity and that we can study these things scientifically shows that actually there's some kind of intelligible explanatory order here.
And so there are going to be indeterministic explanations at play here, assuming a Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is a highly contentious assumption in the first place. Anyway, the quantum phenomena that people appeal to as somehow falsifying the PSR, the various events in question are law-governed events and states that evolve from prior states of the quantum system. You can explain it indeterministically in terms of the prior state of the quantum system together with various indeterministic or non-necessitating or stochastic laws of nature. So these aren't utterly inexplicable. There are explanations here. They're just not necessitating explanations. So no, the PSR doesn't entail modal collapse. No, quantum mechanics doesn't falsify the PSR. Um, conceivability also doesn't falsify the PSR. Sure, maybe we are able to conceive of a world in which some contingent fact obtains without an explanation. But conceivability doesn't entail possibility. I can conceive of a world in which water is H3O or something like that, but that doesn't mean water is possibly H3O. And moreover, I can conceive of a world in which the PSR for contingent truths is true. And of course, the PSR, if true, would be necessarily true as a fundamental metaphysical principle. And so if conceivability entailed or even provided evidence for possibility, well, then we would have some weight of a reason here to think that it's possibly necessary that the PSR is true, in which case per S5, which is a pretty standard system of modal logic, we'd be able to conclude that the PSR is in fact true. So there's a kind of symmetry problem. If you think you've falsified the PSR or at least given evidence against the PSR by means of conceivability, I can just turn around and give it an argument from conceivability for the PSR. But anyway, check out my contingency arguments playlist. I just wanted to allay some worries that some people have for the PSR so that I can at least do something to defend some of these arguments. Don't let it be said that I'm just trying to desperately find any objection that I can to these sorts of arguments. No, I'm actually defending certain premises in these arguments, and eventually I'm going to defend some of the arguments, but I'm actually defending some of the premises in these arguments against objections. So, no, I'm not just trying to desperately reach for objections, any objection I can. I want to serve you guys. I'm not doing this to just refute or rebut or bolster some sort of tribe or anything like that. No. We're in this for truth. We're in this for critical thinking. We're in this to gain a better view of reality, a better picture of reality. But anyway, let's go on. Like the number one objection to this argument. It's that the first premise is false. And the first premise is what's called the strong principle of sufficient reason. So they're just going to want to deny that every contingent fact has an explanation. There are, there are brute facts. So some non-theists are going to say that. Also, some theists are going to say that. Richard Swinburne, for instance. But as I've pointed out, the non-theist doesn't have to do that. The criticisms that I leveled here don't rest on that. This one is also actually available on Bruce's website, I believe. So if you just search for the title of this. And also, it's available as a Medicine of Reason YouTube video. So I made a YouTube video expressly dedicated to this, as I said earlier. So definitely check that out. I'm very proud of it, like I said. Okay, enough of the plugs. Then it'll pull up and you can watch it for, or watch it. You can read it for free if you want to, uh, to learn more about his argument. And Bruce is just like, you need to know who he is. If you don't, you need to look him up. You need to look at what the, the, the sorts of things that he's saying. I've even featured a couple of his talks on this YouTube channel that you can go and watch. One of them was on the argument from beauty and another one was uh, a sort of newish argument for God's existence from uh, paradoxes, like the Grim Reaper paradox that I discuss, or that I've, uh, I've had other philosophers on to. Uh, to and check out my Kalam playlist in that regard, because I go over the Grim Reaper paradox and various other paradoxes, and I critically examine them in tremendous detail with various other philosophers as well. So definitely check that out. Argument number eight, the Gale. So you asked, you asked what the, uh, sorry, you asked what the strongest objection to the previous argument was, and it's the, what, what's called the strong principle of sufficient reason. Well, Alexander Proust and Richard Gale tried to come up with an argument based on a weak principle of sufficient reason, which is premise one here. For any proposition P, if P is true, then possibly there is a proposition Q that explains P. So it's a little bit weaker than that, that strong principle of sufficient reason we encountered before. Uh, premise two, all- Okay, let's stop it there. No, it's not. So the first thing that needs to be said here is the premise one here is not weaker than the strong principle of sufficient reason. Why is that? Well, because this weak PSR strictly entails the strong PSR. Gale and Proust have themselves admitted this. It was shown by Graham Oppie in response to Gale and Proust, and Gale and Proust made another response to them in turn, admitting that, uh, yes, that's right, this weak PSR does entail the strict PSR. So to assert this is basically to assert the strong PSR. It's not weaker. It's basically like saying possibly God exists. If you're in system S5, that's actually not a weaker claim than the claim that necessarily God exists. It's just not a weaker claim. Here's the article from Oppie that I'm talking about on a new cosmological argument. Gale and Proust contend that their new, or new cosmological argument is an improvement, yada, yada, yada. However, I note that their weaker version of the PSR entails the stronger version of the principle, which is used in more familiar arguments, so that the alleged advantage of their proof turns out to be illusory. Moreover, I contend that even if their arguments did rely on a weaker version of the principle sufficient reason, non-theists would still be perfectly within their rights to refuse to accept the conclusion of the argument. And the reasoning actually isn't that hard to follow. So let's just get some definitions on the table and then I'll show you why that is the case. 
So the first definition, a possible world is a maximal compossible conjunction of abstract propositions. And that's a little bit tricky, but compossible, that means they're all jointly possible together. Conjunction, right, that's just like P and Q and R and S and, you know, that's, that's a conjunction. And then it's maximal in that for any proposition P, either P is in this conjunction or else the negation of P is in this conjunction. So that's what maximal means. Just a more intuitive way of thinking about a possible world is just a complete or maximal way that reality could be. And then the big conjunctive fact, or BCF, for a possible world is the conjunction of all the propositions that would be true if that world were actual. And then definition three, the big conjunctive contingent fact, or BCCF, for a possible world is the conjunction of all the contingent propositions that would be true if that world were actual. Now, we've already seen why there cannot be such a thing as the BCCF, but set that aside. The weak principle sufficient reason, or WPSR, claims that for any proposition P, if P is true, then it is possible for some proposition Q to be true and to explain P. And that's contrasted, of course, with the strong principle sufficient reason, or SPSR, which claims that for any proposition P, if P is true, then there is a true proposition Q, which explains P. All right, so with all this in mind, we can now look at the one paragraph long proof. So suppose that there is a world W prime, which is such that the big conjunctive fact for that world has no explanation in that world. Let the BCF for that world be P1. Now consider the conjunctive proposition P1 and P1 has no explanation. So that's a conjunctive proposition, P1 and P1 has no explanation. By hypothesis, this conjunctive proposition is true in W prime. Hence, by the weak PSR, there is a world W double prime in which this conjunction is true and has an explanation. So the conjunctive proposition that P1 and P1 has no explanation has an explanation in W double prime. But that's absurd. If there is an explanation of why P1 obtains and has no explanation, then there is an explanation for why P1 obtains. Hence, P1 both has and lacks an explanation in W double prime. Contradiction. So there can be no world W prime, which is such that the BCF for W prime lacks an explanation in W prime. What this tells us is that with the weak PSR in hand, literally any BCF for any world has to have an explanation. You get the strong PSR from the weak PSR. And then Richard Gale and Alexander Proust published a response to Oppie and others who had criticized their argument. And yes, Gale and Proust in this article say, yeah, <laughs> the weak PSR does entail the strong PSR. So uh, Chad is mistaken that it's a weaker principle. It strictly entails the stronger one. And so to assert the weak PSR is in part to assert the strong PSR. Okay, back to the video, that is to say. So it's a little bit weaker than that, that strong principle of sufficient reason we encountered before. Uh, premise two, all contingently true propositions in the actual world form a big conjunctive proposition. They use the term fact, but just for consistency, I'll just use proposition BCCP, big conjunctive uh, contingent proposition. Uh, possibly, this is premise three, possibly there's a proposition Q that explains BCCP. Four, Q explains BCCP only if Q involves a necessary being. And this is because if Q were wholly contingent, Q would be in BCCP. So Q can't be contingent, but necessary. Premise five, there is a proposition Q that explains BCCP that involves a necessary being. And this follows from three and four, uh, and it's provable in S5, modal system S5, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and the argument is this, look, if possibly Q explains P and Q explains P only if Q is necessary, then possibly Q is necessary. In other words, if Q is, poss Q is possibly necessary, but if Q is possibly necessary, it follows in modal system S5 that it is necessary, so Q. Premise six, Q explains BCCP only if Q reports a personal explanation. And the reason here is that uh, there's a distinction between personal explanations and scientific explanations. Scientific explanations are explanations in terms of the laws of nature, law-like generalities. Personal explanations are explanations in terms of agents and their intentions. So if we ask a question, why is the water boiling? You could give a scientific explanation in terms of the mean kinetic energy, the water molecules, blah, blah, blah. Or you could give a personal explanation, which is that I wanted to make some tea. So we have this distinction between these two kinds of explanation. Well, uh, they point out, Galen Cruz point out, that because scientific explanations are just generalizations over all of contingent reality, uh, Scientific explanations must also be contingent. So scientific explanations can't in involve only contingent propositions, all of which are already included in BCCP. So no scientific explanation, no proposition reporting a scientific explanation can explain BCCP. So whatever proposition explains BCCP, uh, and this is the conclusion, uh, it must, well, it's uh, premise six, must report a personal explanation. And so the conclusion, there's a proposition Q that explains BCCP that involves a necessary being and reports a personal explanation. Okay, so there are lots and lots and lots and lots of problems with this.
We already saw why one just strictly entails the strong PSR, so no one who doesn't antecedently accept the strong PSR would ever grant number one here. But, okay, set that aside. Premise two is false. Nope, they don't form a BCCP. You got Cantor's theorem, we already went through that, so premise two is false. Another point, premise one seems to commit to the existence of propositions, which, of course, pose some quite serious challenges for theism, and especially classical theism. Uh, in fact, I think they're flatly inconsistent with classical theism. If there are abstract propositions, well, some of them are going to be necessarily true, and hence necessarily existent. But then there are necessarily existent things that are numerically distinct from God. But, of course, that's incompatible with traditional classical theism. To say that they're necessarily existent is to say that they cannot fail to exist. And, moreover, they're distinct from God. And so there are things distinct from God that cannot fail to exist. But then, it's false that God both creates everything distinct from him and is free to refrain from creating. And yet classical theism traditionally is strictly committed to, firstly, everything distinct from God being created by God, and secondly, God being able to refrain from creating. So this first premise is going to cause significant challenges for the classical theist especially, but also for traditional theists as Felipe Leon and I point out in our video From Abstracta to Atheism. So that's yet another problem. Another thing that I want to say is that it's not immediately clear that 4 is true. Um, Q explains BCCP only if Q involves a necessary being. To be sure, Q has to be a, some sort of necessary truth, right? It can't be within BCCP, because then it would be a contingent truth, and then it, in some sense it would be explaining itself. And so the thought goes, contingent truths can't explain themselves. I tend to think that nothing can explain itself, but set that aside. So Q just needs to be a necessary truth, but why does it need to involve or report or be about a necessary being? I mean, maybe there's some sort of necessary truth that explains why there is the big conjunctive contingent fact that there is without that necessary truth involving or making reference to or being about a necessary being, which causally produces, let's say, the members of the BCCF. In principle, you might be able to explain why there are contingent things, just by saying it is necessarily the case that some contingent things or other exist. That's not saying that there is some particular contingent thing which necessarily exists. That would obviously be a contradiction. It would then be both necessary and contingent, which is absurd. But rather it's saying necessarily some contingent object or other exists. Again, I'm not saying that that's true, but this argument would need to rule that scenario out, and at least on the face of it, it's not able to rule that scenario out. It would need to show why that couldn't be an explanation of the BCCF. And yet there's nothing in the argument and nothing that Chad has said here that gives us any reason to rule that out. And moreover, it's still a necessary proposition explaining contingent propositions. So we've gone outside of the set. And moreover, we've appealed to the very fact of necessity to be the kind of explanation. And that's precisely what they are appealing to here. After all, it's the necessity of the being, which is at least part of what the difference maker is between it and other things when it comes to requiring an explanation. So premise four is actually quite questionable. So, so far we've seen that premise two is false, premise four is questionable, premise one is not actually weak after all, it, it strictly entails the strong PSR, in fact it's logically equivalent to it because the strong PSR clearly entails this one, so it's literally logically equivalent to the strong PSR, in which case no one who doesn't antecedently accept the strong PSR would be inclined to accept this one. A still further problem for premise 1 is that it faces a symmetry problem. You could equally well say, well, for any proposition P, if P is true, then possibly there is no proposition Q that explains P, right? That seems equally modest, you might say. This one is just saying, hey, possibly there is an explanation of P. And the other alternative principle, which is symmetrical, is just saying, hey, possibly there is no explanation of P. But importantly, if for any true proposition, that proposition is possibly unexplained, that's incompatible with traditional theism, because traditional theism says that any contingent thing whatsoever, and hence any contingent truth, in any world is going to be dependent on God, right? All the worlds trace back to God as the creator of the contingent things in those worlds, right? So you can't have some contingent thing or some contingent truth that's like free-floating from God, that is utterly independent of God. That cannot happen. That's not even a possibility under traditional theism. Under traditional theism, God is essentially Asse and essentially that upon which everything else depends if there are other things. And so if it's even possible that, let's say, there's a contingent thing that's not explained by God, or if it's at least even possible for there to be a contingent proposition which is not ultimately explained by reference to God, well then, traditional theism is false. And so, we have a symmetrical principle with one that is actually incompatible with traditional theism. And given the symmetry between this first premise and that other one, there doesn't seem to be any reason for preferring one over the other.
I mean, you might just say, oh, you know, like, wh- how are you going to support this? It's a possibility claim. So you're probably going to talk about, oh, conceivability, oh, imaginability, oh, I can't see any contradiction in it. You're going to say things like that. But again, I can say the exact same things about there being no explanation for P, right? Oh, I can conceive of it. Oh, I can imagine it. Oh, I don't see any contradiction. You know, like th- those sorts of things. You can equally say those. Admittedly, I do think that there is some sort of symmetry breaker between them in terms of they're not actually being equally supported by actual experience. So yes, in our experience, explicability and things being explained is the norm rather than the exception. And so perhaps that'll give us some inductive reason to prefer this first premise over the second one. But at least insofar as they are modal claims, I, I, don't, I can't see any modal reason that favors one over the other. And if you're talking about sub- being supported by actual experience, And it's actually quite difficult to go just from our actual experience to talking about what is going to be the case in various other possible worlds, possibly extremely remote possible worlds, and the explanatory relations obtaining therein. So that's a potentially serious problem for premise one, this kind of symmetry problem. Also, premise six is false, or at least unmotivated. So let's actually look at the source material here, a new cosmological argument by Richard M. Gale and Alexander Proust. So they just concluded that... Seven, there is in the actual world a proposition Q, such that the actual world's big conjunctive fact contains P and Q, and the proposition that Q explains P. Then they ask, what kind of proposition is Q? It is the burden of the remainder of our argument to flesh out Q. We already know from seven that Q explains P. But just how does Q explain P? The only sorts of explanations we can conceive of are personal and scientific explanations in which a personal explanation explains why some proposition is true in terms of the intentional action of an agent, and a scientific one in terms of some conjunction of law-like propositions, be they deterministic or only statistical, and one that reports a state of affairs at some time. Okay. I need to find some kind words to say here, because I'm, I'm very tempted to say some very mean things here. But, uh, no, no, these aren't the only two explanations that there are. There are boatloads of other kinds of explanations. To say that these are the only two kinds of explanations just strikes me as so patently and obviously wrong. Okay, calm down. I need to calm down. (laughs) So here are a few other kinds of explanations. Firstly, a metaphysical explanation, one that cites neither the intentions of some personal agent, but also not in terms of the evolution of a system and the state of the system at a given time governed by laws of nature. For instance... I don't know how Proust is not, Proust is literally an Aristotelian. He accepts that there is this thing called formal causality, that there are forms, and that these forms kind of unify the constituents and components of something. They give it a kind of organic unity and integrity. They account for persistence over time and so on. These are kinds of metaphysical explanations. The form, the form isn't like some intentional agent that is causing the various parts to be combined, and nor is this some scientific explanation. Firstly, in science, you're not going to find appeal to substantial forms. That's a metaphysical principle that... That's a metaphysical principle of Aristotelianism. But secondly, that's not in terms of the state of a system at some time being governed by either deterministic or statistical laws. How do they not think of things like this? I mean, I just gave one example, formal causality, but there are boatloads of other kinds of metaphysical explanations. Some of them are in terms of grounding, right? You can talk about how the structure of the DNA molecule is grounded in some more fundamental facts about chemistry and so on. Again, this isn't a scientific explanation in their sense, because we're not talking about the state of a system at some time being governed over time by deterministic or statistical laws. No, we're talking about the relations between different levels of reality, more fundamental things somehow grounding or metaphysically explaining non-fundamental things. This is yet another kind of metaphysical explanation in terms of grounding. There are explanations in terms of functional realization. So some things like computer programs are functions that are realized by various pieces of hardware. Part of the explanation of why some program exists or why software exists is that there is hardware that is either actually or even capably of realizing it, of functionally realizing it. Again, we haven't here talked about law-like states of some system at some time, and nor are we necessarily talking about intentional agents. We're talking about the functional realization of some program or some function or some pattern by some kind of hardware or something along those lines. And it doesn't have to be hardware that humans themselves make. Maybe we're even talking about a brain chemistry and functionalist views in the philosophy of mind. Again, whether or not you even agree with those functionalist views in philosophy of mind, it's just false that there is no explanatory payoff there. They do have an explanation of why there are certain mental states in terms of functional realization by different brain states and so on. Again, this is a kind of metaphysical explanation, right? This is not something that you will find in science. It's a metaphysical claim about the nature of the mind. We're not talking about, again, some state of the system being governed by laws, and nor are we talking about a personal explanation. I mean, how hard is it to come up with these examples? So that's just metaphysical explanations, and there are boatloads of other kinds of explanations, ethical explanations. Here's one 
at least partial explanation of why torturing an innocent person is wrong. Because of the badness of the suffering that the victim undergoes. That's part of the explanation. I'm not saying it's the whole explanation, but that's part of the explanation. The explanation that I've just given it doesn't cite the intentional action of an agent, and nor does it cite some state of a system that's governed by deterministic or st stochastic laws. So ethical explanations are in here. Mathematical explanations are in here. You can explain why, for instance, the Pythagorean theorem is true in terms of more fundamental axioms, like the parallel postulate together with the rules of inference within the Euclidean system or whatever. Similarly, you can offer boatloads of different explanations, so suppose that I bet someone that I could find eight people such that they each have a unique day of the week on which they were born. Now, I'm guaranteed to fail. What explains that? Well, it's actually the pigeonhole principle that explains that. That's a prin principle that's used in mathematics. The basic idea is that there are only seven possible slots here. And so if I have eight things to fill within those slots, there's no way to do that without at least one of the things that I'm filling into the slots to be doubled up with another thing that's already in them. This is a perfectly adequate explanation of why I'm going to lose my bet, of why I'm going to be sad later on because I lost this bet or whatever. That's at least part of the explanation there. But again, it's a mathematical explanation. We haven't cited states of a system and plus deterministic or statistical laws, and nor have we cited some kind of personal explanation in terms of intentional actions. We've cited the pigeonhole principle and different mathematical facts. So anyway, I've just gone through boatloads of explanations here. They have nothing to do with scientific explanations or personal explanations. So this is so utterly false. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you can see how passionate, why am I so passionate about this? Anyway, I just, uh, so painful. So yes, they have a premise here. Q is either a personal explanation or a scientific explanation. <laughs> Some sort of conceptual truth in parentheses. <laughs> oh, it is a conceptual truth that that is evidently false. But anyway, you know, what's their reason for saying that it can't give a scientific explanation? Well, the reason is because that Q must contain some law-like proposition, as well as a proposition reporting a state of affairs at some time. But such propositions seem to be contingent, especially the latter. And since they are contingent, they are members of the BCCF, but then they would have to explain themselves, yada, yada, yada. So their only reason for ruling out why it can be a scientific explanation is literally because such propositions seem to be contingent. Nice. I'm convinced. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you. You've convinced me. I'm now a Bible-thumping Christian the Like, come on, man. Such propositions seem to be contingent. That's your only reason for this? Come on. So anyway, I guess my point here is just that they have not at all ruled out. They haven't given us any reason whatsoever to think that there cannot be a scientific explanation which is non-contingent, that is, which is necessary. Perhaps some of the fundamental items investigated by science are themselves necessarily existent. In that case, you could, in principle, have a scientific explanation of a relevant fact, or perhaps even of the big conjunctive, or even the big conjunctive contingent fact, but yet that, that scientific explanation is not contingent. It would be in terms of something necessary. They have given us literally no reason to rule this out. And again, I've given various proposals for what a naturalist-friendly foundation might be, and some of those are going to be perfectly scientifically respectable ones. Of course, like the Neoplatonic one, that's not going to be a scientifically respectable one in the sense that science, of course, doesn't cite that in its explanations. But the ones in terms of like an atemporal wave function monism, the ones in terms of foundational particles or maybe matter or energy or certain fundamental physical principles, lots of those are going to be perfectly scientifically acceptable. So anyway, six is monstrously unjustified, monstrously so, and I would argue that it's very, very, very probably false, given the boatloads of other explanations that we've just gone through. Firstly, explanations that don't fall into that dichotomy of a personal or scientific explanation, and secondly, explanations that are perfectly naturalist-friendly, that don't cite a personal explanation, and yet that cite some sort of necessary foundation of reality. But anyway, my point is just that this conclusion here, this doesn't actually get you to theism. I mean, okay, fine, it gets you kind of close, but you still could have all sorts of personal, necessary, non-God foundations of reality. You could have a deistic view, you could have some kind of God that's morally indifferent, so maybe it's neither wholly good nor wholly bad, and maybe it doesn't even have any goodness or badness properties. You could follow uh, what Draper calls an aesthetic deism hypothesis, so there's this foundational being which is godlike but its preference structure doesn't really map on to goodness and badness but instead maps on only to aesthetic values so it just kind of wants to create a really cool story it doesn't really care if it's good or bad in the moral sense thereof but anyway my point is just that there are lots of hypotheses that this conclusion is perfectly compatible with that are non-theistic so my favorite one, not my favorite but a really cool thing about this argument let me pull it back up here is that gail is an atheist Mm -hmm. he's, he's, I don't know if he's agnostic technically, but he's, he's definitely not a theist. He's a non-theist. Yet, mm -hmm. I just want you to note that he's developed this argument for God's existence with Alexander Proust, and he's defended in the literature and everything. Like that, that to me, it shows a big difference 
between what happens in the philosophy world, like the academic world, as opposed to what happens on YouTube and mm -hmm. in debates on Facebook and on Twitter and stuff. It's like in the philosophy world, in the academic world, they're not afraid to steal man arguments, to attempt to better the other side's position. And so it's just, I don't know, I find that really, really interesting. That Gale, he's a non-theist himself, yet he's defended this argument and developed the dialectic that way. It's just yeah. So I also find that interesting. I mean, one thing that we should note is that the very fact that he's not a theist shows us that while he has been kind of steel manning this argument, the very proponent of the argument doesn't really accept it, right? <laughs> so that's something that's also important to note. I mean, that should give anyone pause who's trying to use this sort of argument as an argument for God's existence, or even something that lends credence to God's existence. I think Gale's work is very underappreciated. <laughs> it's brilliant, and his writing is superb. I love Gale's writing. Moving on to cosmological argument, uh, and this is argument number nine. So... Two philosophers, Katz and Kramer, they think that you can run a cosmological argument without the principle of sufficient reason, based on this principle. And it's the principle of epistemic explanations, they call it. Okay, so kind of a mouthful there. And it's PPE. Given that one, there's a possible explanation of the fact that F, and two, any possible explanation of the fact that F entails P, it's reasonable to believe P. Here's an example. The match is on fire. Any possible explanation of, the fact, of that fact entails that there's oxygen in the atmosphere. So it's reasonable to believe that there's oxygen in the atmosphere. Okay? So we can run the argument. Uh, just for the audience, note that giving an example that fits this schema is by no means an argument to think that the schema is true, nor is it a reason to think that it's true. Chad knows this, right? I'm not attributing this claim to Chad, but my point is just that we should be quite weary. Even if there's one example that fits the schema, doesn't mean that it's a good principle. And I guess my question is, why should we believe this principle? Uh, of course, you know, we can look at the sources, but again, I'm not doing much additional research in addition to what I've already done over the many years that I've been studying this sort of thing. I'm not, I'm not particularly familiar with this argument in particular, so I'm, I'm not going to do the additional research that would be required for me to like go, go to the chapter or paper and like read what the PPE is and like read uh, the various motivations. But I just will note that it's general form, right? It's saying that if X is possible, right, if there's a possible explanation for the fact that F, if some X is possible and X is obtaining and tails Y is obtaining, right, so any possible explanation of the fact tails P, so we're saying if there's something that's possible and that possible thing in any possible world in which that obtains, P obtains, well then it's reasonable to actually believe that P, that, that P is true. But I don't know, this, this structure is really weird. In general, it's not true that if X is possible, if one thing is possible, and that thing entails another thing, oftentimes it's not reasonable to believe that that other thing obtains, right? So think of, think of this. Uh, if a unicorn is possible, and a unicorn's existence entails the existence of a single horned horse that can fly, well, then it's reasonable to think that there are single horned horses that can fly. Like, what? No. Just because X is possible, it might not be actual, right? And so, even if there's a possible explanation of the fact that P, and such an explanation would entail P, it's a further question as to whether or not it's reasonable to believe that P is in fact true. Right? I mean, sure, P is going to be true in any possible world in which there is an explanation of the fact that P, but we're still left completely in the dark, given PPE, as to whether or not there is actually such an explanation of the fact that F. And it's only if there is actually an explanation of the fact that F, I would say, that we are reasonable in concluding that P is in fact true. Otherwise, we face the problem that I was just mentioning, namely the problem with the unicorns. And again, the unicorns thing, I wasn't giving like some explanation of certain facts. I was just pointing out that the abstract structure that PPE takes has various counterexamples. And then I translated the, the counterexamples to the, the, the PPE as I was just explaining it, right? So even if there's a possible explanation of the fact that F, we're left entirely in the dark as to whether or not there actually is an explanation of the fact that F. And so it could just be these other possible worlds in which there are explanations of F that P obtains. And yet we're still entirely in the dark as to whether or not P obtains in the actual world because we're still entirely in the dark about whether or not there's an explanation of F in the actual world. I guess my question is, why should we believe PPE? Okay, but let's let's hear them flesh it out. Uh, with PPE. One, the proposition that there's a unique necessary being who brought about the existence of everything other than itself by willing that the other being should exist would, if true, explain why there are contingent beings. There is a possible explanation of the fact that there are contingent beings. And so one and two, I'm sorry, uh, there, premise three here, there is no proposition consistent with the claim that there are only contingent beings, which, if true, would explain why there are contingent beings. But one and two together satisfy PPE. That's the principle. Given that, one, there is a possible ex explanation of the fact that there are contingent beings, and two, any possible explanation of that fact, of the fact that there are contingent beings, entails P, there is a necessary being, it's reasonable to believe that P, there is a necessary being. So one and two together it just satisfies the main principle here. And we had premise three, and then premise four, any possible explanation of the fact that there are contingent beings entails that there is a necessary being. And so the conclusion 
it's reasonable to believe that there is a necessary being. So uh, the same symmetry problem that we saw with the previous argument is going to be afflicting premise two, right? We could equally well say, well, there's possibly no explanation of the fact that there are contingent beings. That's a symmetrical premise. And yet that would deliver the falsity of traditional theism, as I explained earlier. And so <laughs> we would need some sort of symmetry breaker favoring the second premise over the premise that I was just giving. Also, premise three is arguably false. I mean, here's one such proposition, right, which is consistent with the claim that there are only contingent beings, and which, if true, would explain why there are contingent beings. Right, here is one such proposition. Necessarily, there are some contingent things or other. Right, that's compatible with there only being contingent things, right? Every world could be populated by contingent things. It would just be different contingent things in different worlds. And yet, if true, it would seem to at least provide some sort of explanation as to why there are contingent beings, right? After all, it is necessarily the case. There had to be some contingent beings or other. That's why there are contingent beings, because there had to be some contingent beings or other. Think of it this way. The contrary is literally impossible under this particular proposed explanation. So the, the contrary, it just couldn't have been the case that there weren't any contingent beings. Why are there no water mo molecules that are H3O? Well, why? well, because that couldn't have been the case. And so similarly, water is H2O because that simply must be the case. It's part of the very nature of water to be that way. And so similarly, we could say it's necessarily the case that there are some contingent things or other. It's part of the nature of modal space, say, to be occupied by some contingent things or other. And supposing the contrary would simply be impossible. And so we seem to have a false premise here in number three. Again, I'm not saying that that explanation is in fact true, nor am I saying that it's a better explanation than God. My point is just that this is literally saying that there's no proposition which is consistent with the claim and that would, if true, explain why there are contingent things. So I'm just pointing out that if this proposition were true, right, then it would seem as though we have a kind of explanation, at least some sort of explanation as to why there are contingent beings. So again, premise three is arguably false. And of course, this also shows that premise four is false, right? Any possible explanation of the fact that there are contingent beings entails that there's a necessary being. No, I just gave an explanation that seems in principle epistemically possible, and it's an explanation of the fact that there are contingent beings, and yet it doesn't entail that there's a necessary being. Right? All it says is that necessarily there are some contingent things or other. That doesn't get you that there is some particular being which is such that it necessarily exists. So premise four would also be false. And finally, the obligatory point that I'm going to make at this juncture, the conclusion doesn't deliver you God, it's perfectly compatible with naturalism, they're perfectly naturalist-friendly proposals for what the necessary foundation of reality could be. Kuhn's cosmological argument, uh, published in 1997, was uh, instrumental in, in launching a lot of different cosmological arguments, a very influential cosmological argument, and it's extremely logically tight, okay? So it has, it's, it's based on certain meteorological axioms, a few principles of, ca of causation, and then the argument's off and running. It's similar to the Leibnizian cosmological argument, except with cause, but not explanation. Okay, so here are the myriological axioms. Myriological just being study of parts and holes. So uh, axiom one, X is a part of Y, if and only if anything that overlaps, X overlaps Y. Overlaps just means uh, they share a part in common. Axiom two, if there's a thing of type C, then there's an aggregate or sum of all such types. Three, right, so A2 seems deeply questionable by my lights. If there's a thing of type C, well, then there's an aggregate or sum of all such types. If you put this into the formal apparatus, you're going to be existentially quantifying over aggregates or sums of types. This is ontologically committing to there being aggregates of things or sums of things, but why should I accept that? Maybe I only think that there are the things themselves. There aren't these, like, aggregates or sums of things. Otherwise, I'd have to ontologically commit to there being some thing which is my left ear, your right ear, Donald Trump's left pinky toe, the Eiffel Tower, the state of New York, and Jupiter. Uh, minus one particular particle within Jupiter's absolute center. Like, what? What? No, there is no such thing, okay? Maybe the particular things that I just mentioned exist, but there's no, no, there's no aggregate of them or some of them that's somehow a thing in its own right. No. But maybe he'd be able to modify this axiom to say something different that doesn't ontologically commit to aggregates or sums. X is identical to Y, if and only if X is a part of Y and Y is a part of X. Four, if a whole exists, so do all of its parts. And five, if all of its parts, if all parts of a whole exist, so does the whole. Now, these axioms of myriology are not very controversial, so he's just kind of... Mm, this premise is extremely controversial given the debate about the, the metaphysics of composite objects and whether or not, the, you know, whether or not my, myriological nihilism is true versus myriological universalism versus restrictivism and other sorts of views. So A2 is deeply controversial. Now, as for A5, it's at least prima facie questionable. I mean, you might have all the parts of a watch in existence without, without having that watch in existence. Okay, I guess you could avoid this by saying something like the spatial arrangement of those physical parts is itself one of the parts of the watch. Now, that seems kind of odd, right? I mean, when I'm listing off the parts of the watch, if you list me all the parts and you leave out the spatial arrangement, am I going to say, oh, you missed a part? 
<laughs> the spatial arrangement of like no that seems a little weird and it also seems kind of ad hoc but i guess it's a potential move but if you're not able to say that well then we seem to have a counter example to a5 on our hands I'm taking them for granted now here's a definite but again i could be missing something right we have to have the requisite epistemic humility when we are evaluating these sorts of arguments especially when we haven't done extreme amounts of research into each and every single one of them a wholly contingent thing is something that has no necessary parts it's entirely contingent nothing necessary about it Okay, three principles of causation. Next slide. First, only actual existent things can be causes or effects. Seems pretty reasonable. Second, a cause and its effect must be distinct. A cause can't overlap its effect. And then third, every wholly contingent thing has a cause. So with respect to this third one, it's at least questionable prima facie, right? Many non-theists wouldn't grant this. Now, I myself have some sympathies to principles like the PSR as restricted to contingent things. So I do think I would be willing to grant that every wholly contingent thing has an explanation. Though I'm not convinced that the explanation needs to be a cause. As I've already said, there are lots of non-causal explanations. It could be in terms of grounding or functional realization or logical and structural constraints or mathematical explanation or metaphysical explanation, a moral explanation, and so on. My point is just that Arguably, there are lots of non-causal explanations, and so while I might grant that every wholly contingent thing has an explanation, it's at least not immediately clear to me that every wholly contingent thing has to have a cause as an explanation. Uh, it could have lots of these other sorts of explanations. Maybe it's grounded, but not caused. Maybe it's functionally realized by something more fundamental, but not caused, Then and so on, and so on. Now, the argument runs as follows. Next slide. All parts of a necessary thing are necessary. That follows from axiom four uh, and K. K is just a uh, system modal logic and modal logic. Every contingent thing has a wholly contingent part. The first and second axioms. Uh, definition, let C be the aggregate of whole, all wholly contingent reality. Uh, three, if there are any contingent things, C is wholly contingent thing. That follows from A1, A3, the definition, and lemma one. Uh, lemma four, if there are any contingent things, C has a cause, follows from lemmas three and the uh, C3, which I think is just the different, oh, C3, the uh, third principles of causation. Every contingent thing overlaps C. And then we can derive from these the theorem. If there are any contingent things, then the cosmos, the sum of all, all wholly contingent things, has a cause. That is a necessary thing. Now, okay, so notice that this argument is wholly reliant on all of the axioms and the causal principles that, that we just looked at, right? And I've already offered some reasons, at least for being quite hesitant about a number of them, for thinking that a number of them are questionable. In particular, in this context, why should we ontologically commit to there being this thing, which is the aggregate of all wholly contingent things? I mean, for starters, that itself is a contingent thing. So it would seem as though this aggregate would itself have to be one of the things within the aggregate. So you have this sort of like self-recursive kind of thing, which is like included in itself, and it's also included in itself again, and so on. Like, anyway, it's quite it's quite odd. You get into certain puzzles about that. And also, I mean, you're ontologically committing to an aggregate of like, potentially infinitely many things, at least quadrillions upon quadrillions of things. And I say, why should we ontologically commit to such an aggregate? That seems quite metaphysically profligate, if you ask me. I'm more inclined to more, I'm inclined to more ontologically austere views of what there is. One thing that I do want to note is that uh, I guess it's it's perfectly fine for him to use it this way. But it's slightly misleading to use the term cosmos here to talk about the sum of all wholly contingent things. Because when you think like, oh, the cosmos has to have a cause, you start thinking of something like transcending the cosmos. So, oh, it'd have to be like spaceless and timeless and oh, like no, but the cosmos is just the sum of all wholly contingent things. It's an entirely open question as to whether or not the universe, or what we normally think of as a cosmos, includes some foundational layer which is necessarily existent. Under this technical definition here, right, this foundation of the universe, which is itself in the universe, wouldn't actually count as part of the cosmos. We just have to note that it's slightly misleading to use the term cosmos here. It might just be better to call it like the contingent sum or something like that, or the big conjunctive contingent sum or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, setting that little slight misleading use of language aside, it's not that big of a deal. The, the thing that I want to say is that this conclusion, again, this is the obligatory point, is perfectly compatible with naturalism. It doesn't give us theism, and I would argue it doesn't really take us all that much closer to theism, given that there are boatloads of perfectly naturalist-friendly, perfectly respectable views in metaphysics on which there is some kind of natural, necessarily existent foundation of reality. I said it's a very tight argument, and you can see how tight it is if you just look at my own simplification here. Premise one, there are contingent things. Two, the cosmos is the sum of all wholly contingent things. Now, he's just defining the cosmos in that way. Yes, but also you're ontologically committing to there being this sum of all wholly contingent things, and that's very questionable. Three, 
the sum of all holy contingent things. Now, of course, there's a way to reword the argument, modify the argument, so that you don't ontologically commit to it. You can just do this thing, what's this fancy thing called plural quantification. You can just quantify over a plurality of things, which you're just literally quantifying over the things, kind of considered together, but you're not ontologically committing to some thing, which is their sum or their aggregate. So that's one way you could go here. But then at least note that we're not talking about this argument anymore. We've changed the argument. So, of course, if you want to defend the argument by denying the argument, that's fine. Uh, fine by me. Uh, but anyway, I, then I would just fall back on the various other responses that I've given. That's what most of what we just covered uh, went to establish. And that is a derived. That's not really premise. That's derived from the axioms and definitions. Uh, four. So the cosmos is a wholly contingent thing. Five. Each wholly contingent thing has a cause. Uh, that's the key premise of the argument. Uh, and then six. So the cosmos has a cause that is not a contingent thing. It's namely a necessary thing. And now, I've already kind of given the responses here. So. What's cool about this argument is if you accept the axioms and you accept those three, those, those three principles of causation, it all follows. The conclusion follows. <laughs> okay, thank you for telling me that it's valid. Okay, yes, if you accept all the premises, <laughs> the conclusion follows. Uh. Only premise in this argument, other than the fact that there are contingent things, which isn't, I mean, that's a pretty safe assumption. The only premise of this argument is five. Each right, no, but some of the axioms, right? An axiom is just a postulate, right? You're not defending it, it's just an assumption. So it, there's also a sense in which that's a premise. So if you deny one of the axioms, that's basically also there being another premise, there being another commitment here by which your argument is susceptible to attack. And I've already attacked some of the axioms, for instance. Um, I've attacked the one which ontologically, ontologically commits to there being aggregates or sums. So this is slightly misleading what Chad is saying here. But yes, I, I've also given some reasons to at least be suspicious of this, because we could still say that every holy contingent thing has an explanation, but why does that explanation have to be a causal explanation? There's a big question mark there. Each holy contingent thing has a cause. And he defends five by saying that uh, he, he just appeals to empirical science. He says every every success of common common sense and sciences uh, is by reconstructing causal antecedents uh, of things that we observe in nature. Uh, See, but that's not necessarily true. Lots of our explanatory practices, as I've shown, we don't cite causal explanations. We also cite non-causal explanations, including in science, right? Arguably, scientists, when they're looking at certain structural explanations at a given snapshot of time of less fundamental things being explained by more fundamental things, for example, uh, certain chemical facts being explained in terms of more fundamental physical facts, those are explanations in terms of grounding, right? That's not even a causal explanation. So we just, everything that we see that's contingent is a cause. So that's really the main premise there. And this is a good example of... And of course, you know, as I've said, there could still be a cause, even within the universe, as we normally use the word, like maybe the collection of physical things, or maybe the collection of spatial temporal things, there could still, that's perfectly compatible with there being something within the universe, which is necessarily existent, and being the cause of, quote unquote, the cosmos, which just is the sum of all wholly contingent things. Again, it's a slightly misleading use of the term, but it's fine, because it's stipulative, and as long as we're very clear, that's fine. But... I've noticed a lot of unclarity, not in Coons, not in Chad, but online, right? On the internets. All right, here we go. Here is uh, argument number 11. Should I read this one? Yeah, go ahead. So this one is from Proust and Rasmussen's uh, book. I think I think this is their, their book, Necessary Existence. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Sorry, I'm still catching my breath. I shouldn't be this out of shape. Uh, all right, premise one. For any particular contingent concrete, something that possibly causes something, things, there is an explanation of the fact that those things exist. Number two, considering all the contingent concrete things that exist, if there is an explanation of the fact that those things exist, then there is a necessary concrete thing, and then conclusion just follows, so there is a necessary concrete thing. Yeah, so this is a very crisp argument. It doesn't require you to ontologically commit to, like, sums or aggregates and other sorts of things. There's a lot to be said on behalf of this. Lots of non-theists will challenge premise one. I've already said, however, that I'm quite sympathetic to it, so we can set that aside. Premise two, you might question. I've already gone through in one of the earlier discussions of the arguments. If you remember, I talked about how, in principle, there might be a way to explain why there are contingent things in terms of a necessary proposition, where that necessary proposition doesn't involve or make any reference to something that's a necessary concrete thing. You could say, for instance, that it's necessarily the case that there are some contingent things or other. Arguably, that's going to be an explanation of the fact that those contingent things exist, and yet there would be, under this scenario, no necessary concrete thing, or at least it's consistent with there being no necessary concrete thing. And so premise two here is potentially questionable. And then the third thing that I want to say is that this conclusion doesn't deliver God, of course, right? It's perfectly compatible with naturalism, as we've seen. There are lots of naturalist-friendly views of the foundation. I dare you to take a shot every time I say that. So this is Emmanuel Rutten's uh, atomistic cosmological argument, premise one, there are objects. I've never heard of him or this argument, so I'm really excited. He comes up again later, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll encounter him again. Two, every composite object is ultimately composed of simple objects. Three, every object is caused or is the cause of other objects, another object. The sum of all caused simple objects is an object. The cause of an object is disjoint, which means they don't share a part in common with that object. 
Every caused composite object contains a caused proper part. That's a key premise. Uh, seven, there's... All right, so I have some sympathies with premise two here, but I'm at least not entirely convinced yet. I need to be able to rule out infinitely descending chains of composition. That's one thing to say. Now, again, I find it more plausible that chains of composition must be well-founded, that you can't have an infinitely descended chain of composition, so I tend to find that more plausible, but I still am not sufficiently confident to, like, accept the premise yet. I would need to be given some strong reason to think that infinitely descending chains of composition are impossible. Premise three here seems false, right? I mean, consider abstract objects. Um, those don't seem to be caused, and they are also not the causes of other things, right? Abstract objects are non-causal. They don't stand in causal relations. But of course, there's an easy fix here, right? You could just restrict quantification to concrete objects. So that's not really a problem. Uh, it's just a problem with the presentation. Premise four, though, is, I guess, <laughs> highly doubtful. It seems to rest, again, on something like meriological universalism, which is deeply implausible, at least by my lights. Why would the sum of all caused simple objects have to itself be an object? There's this monolithic object out there, which is like this super disjointed object, which is like the aggregate or sum of all caused simple objects. No, that seems really implausible for the same reasons that I've been going over earlier. It's also not clear that five is true here, that the cause of an object is disjoint with that object. I guess it depends on what disjoint precisely means. If it means wholly non-overlapping, that is, sharing absolutely no parts in common, well then it's not at all clear that the premise is true. One thing could cause another thing to come to be by taking the fir one of the first thing's parts and making it be such that that thing is also a part of the second thing that it brought into existence. So maybe I can get, like, a piece of string and tie it to some of my hair, and I make some sort of bow tie. Maybe I've just created another, a new object, which is like hair bow tie or something. So I was the cause of that, but part of me is my hair, right? And so I was the cause of an object, but part of me is itself part of the object that I caused, right? So I'm not wholly disjoint from the thing that I caused. It's also not clear that premise six is true either. Every caused composite object contains a caused proper part. I mean, why couldn't there be, say, 10 uncaused simple objects, such as super strings or corks or whatever, where one of them causes all the others to take on a specific arrangement or configuration, thereby causally bringing about the existence of a new object with that specific arrangement, despite the fact that the object has no caused proper parts? That, that seems like an epistemic possibility. You'd need to rule that out if you want to assert premise 6 here. And then, of course, premise seven doesn't deliver God. It's perfectly compatible with naturals, and there are lots of naturalist friendly, etc. So, take another shot. You can find his dissertation online by searching Emmanuel. Well, the title of the, his dissertation is the resource. Oh, concerned. Pause. Ah, oh, yes, the fated Kalam cosmological argument. One thing to check out here is my Kalam playlist, as well as my ongoing series with rationality rules. Another thing to check out is this Philosophical Disquisitions blog. It's by a philosopher. He has amazing posts on philosophy of religion, and in particular he has this series index. He's done tons of series on the philosophical apologetics of William Lane Craig, especially with respect to the Kalam cosmological argument. And he goes through professionally published articles and basically gives a kind of layman's summary of them in some sense. I mean, it's still somewhat technical, but it's much less technical than the articles themselves. So, for instance, he looks at an article by Wes Morrison. He, he develops the article a little bit further. He gives his own thoughts. He summarizes the article. It's amazing. He, he talks about Wes Morrison's papers in response to it. He's looked at Justin Schieber's objection to the Kalam. He's looked at Landon Hedrick's criticisms of Hilbert's Hotel. He's done a post, two posts on that. He's done Craig and the argument from successive edition, a part on that. He's done Stephen Purrier and on finitism, the beginning of the universe, and so on. So, uh, and of course, he goes through a bunch of different other things like the moral argument, etc. And again, he's going through professionally published articles that are critically appraising the arguments from William Lane Craig and others. I highly, highly recommend checking out this post in particular, but also, of course, the sub-posts that are being linked here. But back to the Kalam. So I actually find premise one plausible. Importantly, though, I think the arguments in favor of it actually aren't super strong or super compelling. I, I would want to probably say whatever begins to exist has an explanation, maybe not necessarily a cause. There might be able to be something that has a front edge in terms of its temporal boundary, but perhaps it's still explained by some ontologically prior thing, but that doesn't cause it, but still explains it. So maybe it grounds it or it functionally realizes it or something. But anyway, setting aside that, I, I still find the, the principle 
reasonably plausible. And like I said, the arguments in favor of it actually don't don't strike me as super strong or compelling. The main reason why I at least somewhat lean towards thinking it's true is that it just strikes me as, as really plausible. It is just generally confirmed in our experience. And so that seems to, both of those seem to give me some defeasible reason to accept the principle. And I haven't yet come across a su- sufficiently weighty defeater for these sorts of defeasible justifications. But I will note, though, that there are lots of theism-unfriendly principles that also strike me as true, and that are also equally confirmed by experience and so on. So that's a problem if someone wants to use the Kalam to support theism. But anyway, I go through that in my series with Stephen, so definitely check that out. And in fact, using one of those principles that not only strikes me as intuitively plausible, but that it's also constantly confirmed in our everyday experience, we could mount a parody cosmological argument against traditional theism. So premise one, every material object that begins to exist is made from some ontologically or temporally prior things or stuff. Premise two, the universe is a material object that began to exist. That's identical to the Klum's second premise. So the universe is made from some ontologically or temporally prior things or stuff. But if that's true, traditional theism is false, right? Because then God isn't creating the universe ex nihilo. It's coming from some pre-existent things or stuff. And that pre might be temporally prior, but could also be ontologically prior. It doesn't necessarily have to be a temporally prior things or stuff. So if that's true, of course, traditional theism is false, right? Because you don't have creation ex nihilo then. So it follows from that that traditional theism is false. That first premise seems equally confirmed by the exact same reasons that favor this one, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. It's intuitive. It's supported by our inductive experience. It's constantly confirmed in our experience. It's proved fruitful in in science. And it even undergirds lots of conservation principles and so on. It nicely gives us an explanation of why the conservation principles are true and so on down the list of the reasons for thinking that the first premise here is true. There doesn't seem to be a symmetry breaker between this first premise and the premise that I just gave that could differentially support one or the other. And in which case, if you're going to accept this first premise, it seems as though you have to accept the first premise that I just gave and with it deny traditional theism because after all, that's all the other stuff is basically either had in common with the Kalam or else it's just itself a definitional commitment of traditional theism to creation ex nihilo. So that's something that's very interesting and I find, you know, reasonably plausible as a kind of parody argument. Now, what about premise two? Well, I think the scientific case for it is really underwhelming, to be honest. You can see the video in my Kalam playlist where it's on the channel Digital Gnosis. It's with philosopher of physics Daniel J. Linford and also Phil Helper, or maybe it's Helper. He is the skydive, he's the person behind the skydive field documentary that I did a video on. It's like a three hour long video. It's a response to Trent Horn. But anyway, they go through the scientific case and show why no, the scientific evidence doesn't, after all, support that the universe itself began to exist. At best, all that we know is that our local spatiotemporal manifold began to expand a finite time ago. It's a further question as to whether or not it began to exist. And it's also a further question as to whether or not there are other spatiotemporal manifolds that precede our local spatiotemporal manifold. And I mean, just to caution people who try to use the scientific evidence here, as Graham Oppie points out in a chapter published in 2020 in the book Contemporary Debates in Philosophy of Religion, He points out that, quote, there is currently no widespread consensus among expert cosmologists about whether we live in something like a standard Big Bang universe or whether our universe is part of an infinite ensemble of universes in a background de sitter space in which there is an infinite causal regress, end quote. So again, there's just no widespread consensus among expert cosmologists about about the scientific case concerning premise two. Another thing to note here is that even if you could establish that the scientific evidence shows or gives us good reason to think that the past is finite, It would only be able to show that firstly for physical time, right? But I mean, Craig himself thinks that there's metaphysical time. He thinks that God could, for instance, count up one, two, three, and then create the universe and then, you know, create along with it physical time. But there would still be metaphysical time preceding that. So even if you could show that (laughs) physical time began to exist, it's a further question as to whether or not there's a metaphysical time that's in some sense preceding physical time and that's infinitely long, right? So you're still not really going to be able to show that temporal things, at least, the collection of temporal things began to exist, even if you could show that this local spatiotemporal manifold began to exist. But anyway, even ignoring that, right, past finitude still isn't sufficient for beginning to exist. The universe could exist in a non-metric or amorphous or undifferentiated time prior to the beginning of metric time, or some physical object could, or The physical object could be timeless sans metric time, that is timeless without metric time, and then temporal since. So that's a kind of naturalist, a naturalized Craigian view. Uh, Or you could simply have a timeless phase or portion of some physical object and a temporal phase or portion of that temporal, uh, and a temporal phase or portion of that physical object. So again, these are all ways that the universe could be past finite, and yet not begin to exist, because either it has some portion or phase of its life that's timeless, and so... Uh, The universe as such, as an object, didn't come into being at the first moment. And again, maybe the universe is timeless sans metric time and temporal sense, or maybe uh, the universe... Or maybe the universe exists in a kind of metrically amorphous or non 
a metrically amorphous or non-metric or undifferentiated time prior to the beginning of metric time. So that's a kind of Swinburne, Paget, Mullins type view, naturalized, of course. My point is just that there are boatloads of proposals here where you could have a universe having a finite past, and yet the universe doesn't begin to exist. After all, Craig thinks that God has a finite past. God came into time at the first moment of time. But yet God didn't begin to exist for Craig, because then God would have to have a cause. So the way that Craig avoids this, so the way that Craig does this is, you know, he has a very technical sense of beginning to exist. And it doesn't include things that were timeless sans the beginning of time and temporal sense. It also doesn't, or at least shouldn't, include things that existed in a kind of amorphous or undifferentiated time or non-metric time prior to the beginning of metric time, and so on. So anyway, the scientific case is extremely underwhelming. The philosophical case is also underwhelming. The successive addition argument, I did a video on that with Wes Morriston. Of course, starting with a finite collection, you can't, of course, successively add to that collection finitely many elements to get an infinite collection, but that's of course not what's happening in the case of an infinite past, right? You always have an infinite collection and you're just adding one member to it. And that of course is always going to be resulting in an infinite set because you started with an infinite set. And so again, the fact that you can't start with a finite set and then successively add to get to an infinite set that tells us nothing about the infinite past, you might say, oh, well, you can't count to infinity, so how could you count down from infinity? Uh, but of course there's a relevant difference there. The reason you can't count to infinity, or at least one reason why you can't count to infinity, is that the natural numbers that you're counting don't come to an end, right? There is no immediate predecessor to this number Aleph Null. I mean, Aleph Null in some sense stands outside of the series. Um, so the numbers that you're counting are endless. And so of course you can't get to the end of an endless series. That's the reason why you can't count to infinity. But of course that reason is not present in the case of a beginningless past, right? Because there is an end to the beginningless past, namely now. There's a relevant difference between counting to infinity and counting down from infinity, quote unquote, whatever that means, uh, counting down through all the negative integers, let's say, from the past to the present. There's a relevant difference. And the relevant difference is that when you're trying to count to infinity, the reason why you can't do that is because that would require coming to an end of an endless process. But obviously, if it's an endless process, then you can't come to the end of it. But of course, the past does have an end. So you remove that barrier to being able to complete that. Well, you might try to say, oh, but it doesn't have a beginning. Yes, it doesn't, but why should that impugn your ability to traverse it? At the end, it just bottoms out in a flat assertion, as Wes Morstan points out in his AJP article published in 2021 and that I talked with him about on my channel. So anyway, the successive edition argument is really underwhelming. Hilbert Tertel and Actual Infinites is extremely underwhelming as well. Firstly, it's not even absurd. I don't share the intuitions in question. Of course, you would be able to do the relevant manipulations. It's precisely what we should expect. Second, the allegedly absurd implications result from manipulations of the members, right? You're like manipulating the members, subtracting them in various ways and so on. But of course, you can't manipulate past days, right? The past is fixed. It's over and done with. You're not able to like transform past days in such a way that you could like manipulate them, subtract them, and so on. So there's a relevant disanalogy between Hilbert's Hotel and the past. What makes the former absurd is not present in the latter. So there's relevant dissimilarity such that you can't infer the absurdity of the latter from the absurdity of the former, even granting that, it was, that it's absurd, which I wouldn't grant. Thirdly, <laughs> mathematical realism is, I think, arguably a straightforward counterexample to the claim that there cannot be actual infinites. Also realism about propositions and so on. I think there are quite plausible arguments for mathematical realism and so on, and arguments for the realism about propositions. And of course, if mathematical realism is true or realism about propositions is true, well, then there are infinitely many such mathematical objects or mathematical truths or infinitely many such propositions. Of course, you might try, as William Lane Craig does, to go a nominalist route, but of course, nominalism is monumentally controversial. I'm not going to say that it's inconsistent or whatever, but I do think that there are plausible arguments for realism. We're not going to get into that here. I'm just giving you reasons why I reject the Hilbert's Hotel argument. A fourth reason is that, well, an endless future is also an actual infinite. No, it's not a potential infinite. A potential infinite is a collection such that the number of members in the collection is finite, but always increasing. But an endless future, we're just talking there about how many days will occur. We're not talking about how many days will have occurred at some arbitrary point selected in the future between that future point and the present. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just the number of days later than today or how many days will occur. And the answer there is obviously Aleph Null, infinitely many. If it were only finitely many, if there were only finitely many days, each of which is such that it will occur, then eventually the future is going to come to an end, right? If there were only 10 days, each of which will occur, well then, <laughs> once you come to the end of the 10th day, that's it. That's the, the, the future is done, right? Everything is just going to blink out of existence because <laughs> otherwise it wouldn't have been true way back when that there will be 10 more days. No, that was false. An endless future is not at all a potential infinite. It's an actual infinite. I talk about all of this in my video response to Trent Horn. An actual infinite, by the way, is just a collection whose members can be paired into one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. It doesn't, it doesn't require that all the members exist. Craig, after all, thinks the past 
if the past is beginningless, is an actual infinite, but he's a presentist, so he thinks the past doesn't exist. What matters is that if the past is beginningless, then yes, the collection of past days can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. But of course, the same is literally true of an endless future, right? You can, you can pair one with tomorrow, two with the next day, three with the following day, four with the following day, five with the following day, such that each natural number is paired with a unique future day. And it literally mathematically follows from that. It's undeniable that the number of future days, that is, days which are later than today, can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, in which case they literally satisfy the definition of an actual infinite. There is no getting around this. So if actual infinites are impossible, then an endless future is likewise impossible, in which case that would disprove Christianity, of course, because Christianity posits an endless future, namely an endless, after and namely an endless afterlife in heaven or hell. If you're a universalist, it would just be heaven, of course. And you probably should be. So anyway, those are four problems for the Hilbert's Hotel argument. There are many more. Arguments for causal finitism, which likewise support premise. Arguments for causal finitism, which are taken to support premise two here. Those arguments usually rely on something like Benedetti paradoxes, but I think the best solution to Benedetti paradox is, is recognizing that they have just a logically inconsistent abstract structure, and that this structure actually isn't at all tied to causal or spatial considerations. You can get thoroughly non-causal Benedetti-type paradoxes. And what that shows us is that it's really the unsatisfiable pair which is what's driving the absurdities. It doesn't have anything to do with infinite causal chains. And of course, you can construct future-oriented Benedetti paradoxes, which likewise entail the impossibility of an endless future. Just imagine that each reaper swings its scythe, if and only if no future reaper swings its scythe. And imagine also that the future is endless, such that there's a reaper assigned each day. This is also a Benedetti paradox. You can actually derive a contradiction from the specifications that I just gave. Now you might of course say, oh, well, how do the reapers know what's going to happen in the future? Well, that's a relevant difference. No, you can just add in the picture a god who has foreknowledge, and so the god can reveal to each reaper whether or not some reaper in its future is going to do something. If you're a theist, you already think that god exists and has foreknowledge of the future and can reveal things to people. So that's no problem in the present context. Because after all, they're trying to use this as an argument for theism. So those are two responses to appeals to causal finitism in support of premise two here. Plus, again, past finitude isn't sufficient for beginning to exist, right? A still further point to note here, so I've just gone through premise one and premise two here. The conclusion here is perfectly compatible with naturalism. It doesn't get you to theism. Some of the things that they say on behalf of bridging the gap here are just utterly implausible. Sometimes they say, oh, well, the only immaterial things we know of are either minds or numbers. But that is, of course, absurd. It could be some timeless quantum field or maybe a non-spatiotemporal universal wave or maybe a non-spatiotemporal universal wave function that Alyssa Ney and Jill North and various other philosophers have been talking about. Or maybe it's the Tao, or maybe it's an impersonal conception of Brahman, or maybe it's an impersonal conception of the Platinian One, or maybe it's even something we know not what. Of course, if you're allowed to say, oh, well, the only immaterial things that we know of are either minds or numbers, I can also just equally say, oh, well, the only minds that we know of are embodied minds. And yet, given what defenders of the Kalam want to say, the cause of the universe cannot itself be embodied, and hence, what I can conclude there is that it therefore couldn't be a mind. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If you're just going to say, oh, well, the only two things that we know of are either this or this, and given the nature of the case, it couldn't be one of them, so it has to be the other, well, I can also say the only minds that we know of are embodied, and yet, given the nature of the case at hand, the cause we are supposing couldn't be embodied, and hence it can't be a mind. It's the same sort of reasoning. Now you, might have, now you might say, oh no, there's also a disembodied mind, namely God, but that's of course the very question at issue. That would be a question-begging response. Another thing to note here is that we can't even establish that the cause of the universe in the sense of our local spatial temporal manifold is immaterial. It could very well be something that's material, but that exists in a kind of non-metric or metrically amorphous or undifferentiated time, a la Swinburne, Paget, Mullins, and so on. Or it could be timeless sans the beginning of metric time and temporal sense. Or, of course, it could be just a timeless material thing. I'm using material as synonymous with physical there. They also say things like, oh, well, the only way to get a temporal effect from a timeless cause is free will. I say, no, you only need indeterministic causation so that the cause isn't sufficient for the effect. And of course, impersonal indeterministic causation is perfectly kosher. We have perfectly kosher models of this from quantum mechanics. And moreover, there's nothing conceptually incoherent about it. So no, the timeless cause doesn't need free will. They also try to say, oh, well, it's enormously powerful. It, you know, cause the universe to begin to exist. <laughs> No, it doesn't need to be enormously powerful. The only power it needs to have is to be able to initiate the first chain. And then <laughs> reality gets going on its own from there. So no, it doesn't need to be enormously powerful. Literally, the only thing it needs to be able to do to cause the beginning of metric time in particular is just to cause the first change. That's literally all it needs to do. Maybe literally there's just some indeterministic fluctuation within a field or something like that. And then boom, that starts the beginning of time. That doesn't require it to be enormously powerful. It literally needs only one power, and it can be a perfectly benign and just really just utter lame power, like being able to indeterministically cause some like fluctuation or whatever.
So I could go on and on and on about the Klon, but I'm not going to because I want to keep this video at least under 10 hours. That's the goal, but maybe I won't be able to meet it. We'll see. At this rate, I don't think I will, but <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, that's just a basic rundown of the Klom. There's so much more to say. And if you want to see what I have to say, check out my Klom playlist. Something has a cause. Two, there are no causal loops. Nothing causes itself. Three, nothing has an infinite causal history. And that's the burden of his book, uh, Infinity Causation and Paradox, I think. There it is. So there is an uncaused cause. That, fo that follows directly from one, two, and three. Um, five, there is, if there's an uncaused cause, God exists. Six, so God exists. So premise five is false. No, it's not the case that if there's an uncaused cause, God exists. I've already gone through lots of naturalist friendly proposals for what a first cause might be. So yes, take another shot because I brought up the same point. And also premise three here is deeply questionable. I just mentioned it in my assessment of the preceding argument. So on to the next one. There you go. And that one, like you said, is definitive cosmological argument. I'll let you take this one. Yeah. So Swinburne famously makes a distinction between two different kinds of inductive arguments, good inductive arguments. The first is what he calls a P inductive argument. And that's just when a piece of evidence makes a hypothesis more likely true than not. So it pushes the likelihood of the hypothesis over uh, half, basically. It makes it more likely true than not. Now, by contrast, there are C inductive arguments, which are arguments where some piece of evidence just makes the hypothesis more likely. Not more likely than not. It just make, it just increases the probability of the hypothesis a little bit. Okay, so that's how he frames his cosmological argument. He thinks the universe makes for a, a good C inductive cosmological argument. So one, the universe exists and is a certain way. Namely, it's complex, yet everything behaves in an orderly law-like way. It is such as to be suitable a, a suitable theater for humans and animals to evolve. Humans did evolve so as to be able to have true beliefs about the world and to meaningfully act within it. Okay, so if theism can explain why the universe exists and is this way better than naturalism can, then the universe ex that the universe exists and is this way makes theism more likely than naturalism. Well, theism can explain why the universe exists in this, this, in this way where, better than naturalism can, so the universe exists and is, is this way makes theism more likely than naturalism. Now, the main premise here is going to be two. Uh, yeah, so... Premise two is arguably false. I mean, it just depends on whether by better explanation we are only taking into account likelihood ratios. That is, the ratio between the probability of the evidence given one hypothesis to the probability of the evidence given the competing hypothesis, right? That's the likelihood ratio. You're basically just comparing how expected the data is on the hypotheses in question. In terms of assessing explanations, if we're just talking about the explanatory power of those explanations, well then, yeah, we're only really going to be looking at the likelihood ratio. But when we're assessing explanations, we don't only look at explanatory power, we also look at their simplicity. And because of that, we should be taking into account the prior probabilities here, the ratio of the priors. There, there's kind of, there's a dilemma here. Suppose that we're only taking into account likelihood ratios when we're talking about a better explanation. Okay, well then, we might be able to grant premise two, but then three here is going to be just clearly false. Because we can only conclude that theism is more probable than naturalism, as such, if the likelihood ratio multiplied by the ratio of the priors is greater in favor of theism. So even if the likelihood ratio with respect to the data in question favors theism, it could still be that theism is less probable than naturalism so long as the ratio of the priors favors naturalism to a sufficiently counteracting degree. And I think it arguably does, given Draperian reasoning. You can see, for instance, his Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article entitled Atheism and Agnosticism. It's a wonderful article, so definitely check that out. So that's the first one of the dilemma. If we are only baking into what we mean by a better explanation, that it only takes into account the likelihood ratios. In that case, premise three is false. But if that's not what we're only taking into account, the likelihood ratios, we are also taking into account the priors. And then premise two is deeply questionable, right? We're going to need to also take into account the prior probability of theism and compare it with naturalism. What's more, we also need a ceteris paribus clause for premise two. That is a clause <laughs> that is a clause to the effect of other things being equal, that the universe exists and is the way it is, makes theism more likely than naturalism. Why is that? Well, because even if the relevant data here favors theism over naturalism, lots of other data arguably favor naturalism over theism. So if you want to conclude that theism is more likely than naturalism, you have to take into account our total evidence. And at least one point to make at this juncture is that premise three here is at least contestable. We can still ask, why would God do all this? Why would he make a complex universe that behaves in an orderly law-like way? Why would he b make specifically humans and animals? Why would he make us evolve in this particular way and to meaningfully act within the world in the particular ways that we do, right? What is it about God that leads us to expect that God would do these sorts of things, right? Why would he create a universe like ours? And so on. You need to be able to give some reason for thinking that this is expected or at least not as surprising as it is on naturalism. Now, of course, Swinburne tries to do that, but I'm just pointing out, giving you guys tools for thinking critically about this sort of thing.
And moreover, even if you could give such reasons, like, oh, these things would be really valuable, and uh, God, because he's perfect, would be inclined towards producing value. I mean, there are infinitely many other states of affairs that are super duper valuable, but that don't involve humans and animals. Maybe God could create, let's say, some kind of heavenly realm where it's just like non-physical things, and they're in a relationship with one another, and they behave in an orderly law-like way, and they can be in relationship with God and act morally and so on. Why should we expect a physical universe as opposed to that one? God could create some kind of simulation universe. God could create some kind of almost like a theistic idealist universe, maybe a kind of dreamlike world in his own mind, where he still has creatures and so on, but they're not like physical beings. My point is just that even if you can show that the particular array, ensemble of things that we find in our universe, the order, the law-like stuff, um, the fact that it's a theater for us to meaningfully act and to have true beliefs and so on, even if you can show that, yeah, all of that's like really valuable and like God is inclined to valuable things, so he'd likely produce us or something like that, or that's more expected on theism than under naturalism. Like, even if we grant you those sorts of considerations, it's actually still not clear that we'd be able to generate an expectation that, that God would bring about this particular ensemble of values, as opposed to the infinitely many other ensembles of values similar values that God could bring about. God could, for instance, design the psychophysical laws in a different way, such that the only things in existence are little particles, like electrons and so on. But the psychophysical laws are super complex, and they're such that, like, when an electron is a certain distance from another electron, they experience a certain uh, affection or love for one another. And when they're a different distance, they, like, communicate stuff to one another, they communicate a secret to one another. When they're still further distance, they are singing praises to God or whatever. You can consider these sorts of mental states as non-physical, as many theists are wont to do. And, of course, God himself is not physical and has mental states, so there's no ruling that out. And so you could have different psychophysical laws with a completely different physical universe and yet still manifest all these different values. So why would theism pick out this particular universe among the infinite array of other universes that have the similar or the same ensemble of values? It's not clear that you can get the kind of predictive or explanatory value that this argument is promising with respect to theism. And even if you could, like, okay, maybe you just say, God just desires to make this universe, and he's going to do it, okay, because <laughs> he's omnipotent. But then you're securing a high likelihood only at the cost of making your theory uh, have a super low prior. And of course, the naturalist could posit just some, like, disposition on its foundation toward the kind of universe that we, in fact, see on the part of the naturalistic fundamental reality, right? In that case, they could also get a high likelihood, but they have a correspondingly low prior probability because they're almost building the data in to their priors. Furthermore, lots of theists are going to want to take a kind of skeptical theism with, in response to the problem of evil. And in fact, it's really difficult to avoid skeptical theism in light of the sheer utter horrors that we find in reality. But once you have skeptical theism on board, arguably it's going to be really difficult to generate expectations about the kind of universe that we would expect God to make. After all, God is this infinite intellect, right? He's aware of boatloads of reasons of which we are unaware. And the reasons that we are aware of aren't even representative of the total range of reasons that there are for God to act and for God to create the kind of world that he does. And in that case, it's hard to see how we could be justified in generating predictions, precise expectations about what God would do. Again, because God's ways are mysterious. His ways are not our ways. The range of reasons of which we are aware that God might act upon are not representative of the range of reasons that God does act upon. So even if you'd be able to block certain arguments from evil by means of this kind of skeptical theist response, and arguably <laughs> skeptical theism is going to have to be taken in response to at least some of these sorts of horrors because all the other theodicies look just utterly implausible in light of it, that's going to hurt you. That's going to turn around and hurt you when it comes to these sorts of Bayesian arguments in connection to these Swinburne-style arguments and other sorts of arguments. And this will be a, a criticism that reverberates later on when we're talking about design and other sorts of things. So at least keep that in mind, even though I'm, I might not explicitly draw it out in certain later arguments. But it's always something to keep in mind. Anyway, the final thing I want to say here is that I'm still somewhat inclined to think that I guess in general, intelligibility and large-scale structure, order, harmony, and beauty provide some evidence for theism over naturalism. I do have reservations about what I said in light of stuff about skeptical theism and why would we expect God to bring about this particular ensemble of values given that there are arguably infinitely many other ways to bring about the same or at least similar kinds of values that don't at all resemble the kind of universe that we live in. But anyway, I guess there's something still pulling me here about there's still some evidential force with respect to intelligibility and large scale structure and order and harmony in favor of theism. So I guess that's a positive thing I could say on behalf of the argument after giving that array of critical appraisals. Why think naturalism can't explain why the universe exists and is this way better than theism? Well, again, he draws on this distinction between personal explanations and scientific explanations. Um, naturalism only has scientific explanations available to it. It doesn't have personal That's... No, no. Firstly, this distinction... No. Just no. There are boatloads of other kinds of explanations. But yeah, naturalists can cite boatloads of metaphysical explanations of various large-scale features of the universe.
For instance, they might explain laws of nature in terms of causal powers of things, and causal powers in terms of the natures of those things. This stuff is perfectly kosher by various naturalists' lights. Of course, lots of naturalists aren't going to accept that, but other naturalists can accept that, and there are various other explanatory means. You don't just have to give a kind of, oh, this scientific explanation, citing the state of a system, plus laws governing its operation or evolution over time, and so on. Like, no, there are boatloads of other kinds of explanations available. And, of course, like, you can say, oh, well, theism has a person, and so, you know, God can bring this about. He can intend it or something like that. But of course, you still have all the same problems that I was just pinpointing about actually generating the expectation that God would intentionally bring these various facts about. The only thing that could explain the universe at the cosmological level is a personal explanation. So that's why theism is more probable. The universe makes theism more probable than naturalism. That's just false. There are boatloads of other kinds of explanations. So. Okay, let's move on. Uh, rule cosmo modal cosmological argument. That's, that should be fun. Go ahead. Whatever cannot possibly exist from something else possibly exists from itself. It's possible that a first causal potency exists. Now, by first causal potency, he means a first cause, but not necessarily one that exercises its causal power. Okay? Uh, the first causal potency cannot possibly exist from something else, so it's possible that a first causal potency exists from itself. What is non-existent cannot bring anything into existence, even if, per, per impossible, what is non-existent could bring something else into existence, could bring itself into existence, it would not be altogether uncausable. So, it's not possible for something to exist from itself, which does not actually exist from itself. So, a first causal potency does exist from itself. All right. Premise one, as stated here, is just false. Here's a counterexample. A square circle, so something that is both a square and a circle, at one and the same time and in the same respect or whatever, so it's both a square and a circle, it has four sides and it also has zero sides. A square circle cannot possibly exist from something else. And yet it is false that a square circle possibly exists from itself. So we have the antecedent satisfied here, but the consequent is not satisfied. A square circle cannot possibly exist from something else, the reason being that it cannot possibly exist, and so a fortiori it cannot possibly exist from something else. And yet, obviously, it's false that it possibly exists from itself, because it's impossible. It doesn't possibly exist at all, let alone possibly exist from itself. So that's a straightforward counterexample, and the same, of course, is true of other metaphysical impossibilities, right? Other metaphysical po impossibilities are going to be a counterexample to premise one. And, of course, no one who doesn't already accept theism would grant that God is a metaphysical possibility, given the standard system of modal logic, S5. So anyway, that's that's premise one. What about premise two? I'd say it needs motivation. Why accept that that's possible? You might appeal to conceivability. You might try to appeal to these other sorts of things. But those things don't entail metaphysical possibility, and it's at least questionable whether they provide evidence for it. And moreover, you're going to be facing a symmetry problem. You could equally well say that it's possible that a first causal potency doesn't exist. And of course, that's going to be incompatible with traditional theism. So then we'd need some symmetry breaker that breaks the epistemic parity, with a T, parity, or symmetry between the different possibility premises here with respect to number two, premise two. Premise three is also contestable, right? Why can't something be first in this world, but non-first in another world? Now, perhaps you might appeal here to an Aristotelian causal powers view of modality. That could possibly help, but we don't need to get into that further. And of course, the final thing that I want to note here is that the conclusion is perfectly compatible with naturalism. So yes, take another shot because there are perfectly respectable, naturalist friendly accounts of a first causal potency that is fundamental, that doesn't exist from something else. Of modal cosmological argument. I feel like I should let you read this one again. You're just All covering right. so much ground that I'm not familiar with. It is impossible that anything prevent the existence of God. That just is conceptually okay, I agree with God. That. Yeah. For every individual X, if it is a fact. All right, so <laughs> premise one. We can ask, what does prevent mean here? I mean, sure, there isn't some, like, ghostly or spooky causal force that, like, restrains God, preventing him from bathing in the realm of being, and instead tethering him to the realm of non-being. In other words, there is nothing that's, like, exerting some sort of causal influence so as to prevent God from existing, or, like, causally preempting his existence. But... So what, right? Things can be impossible despite there being nothing that's exerting some causally preventative force, right? Water cannot be H3O, but it's not as though there are like water fairies that exert some causal influence to prevent water from ever being H3O. So anyway, it sort of depends upon what we mean by prevent here. If we mean something, again, that exerts some sort of causal influence to like preempt or prevent something from existing, then that's going to make no headway whatsoever in establishing the possibility of the thing in question, because there are lots of impossibilities that don't have some sort of causal force preventing them. By contrast, if we mean something broader, as I think is actually indicated by premise two here, just in terms of like something that explains why God doesn't exist, well, then there are boatloads of explanations that you can offer for why God doesn't exist, or the naturalist can offer, that the, the atheist can offer. Here's one 
God is impossible. The naturalist already thinks, we learned this from the modal ontological argument debate, the naturalist already thinks that God is impossible. It is not possible that God exists. It is necessarily false. That is just, that is a perfectly kosher explanation of why God doesn't exist. That's all you need to cite as to why, for instance, there are no square circles. Such things would be contradictory, and moreover, contradictory things cannot exist. So, square circles cannot exist, and that's what explains why they don't exist. You might say its contradictoriness explains why it doesn't exist, but by itself, that's not going to get you to it. You have to add the further principle that contradictory things cannot exist. It's only by adding that further claim that you're able to derive that the square circle cannot exist. So again, ultimately, you're appealing to the impossibility of something to explain why it doesn't in fact obtain. And so premise one here would then be false. It's perfectly possible that something prevent the existence of God in the sense of it's perfectly possible for there to be an explanation for the non-existence of God, at least by the atheist's lights. And of course, you can't non-question-beggingly assume that the atheist is wrong here in an argument for God's existence. So again, no headway is made in this argument in establishing or justifying or giving any reason whatsoever for why God exists. But anyway, let's continue because I have more things to say. The fact that X exists or a fact that X does not exist, it is possible that there is an explanation for the fact that X exists, uh, for the fact that X exists, um, that must be a typo, uh, and the fact that X does not exist. That's a version of the PSR. So suppose for reductio that God does not exist, for it is possible that there's an explanation for the fact that God does not exist. Five, it is not possible that there's an explanation for the fact that God does not exist. Six, it is, it is and is not possible that there's an explanation for the fact that God does not exist, which is a contradiction. Uh, so we reject the premise that we assumed, which is three, God does not exist. And so it's false that God does not exist. Yeah, so premise two here is deeply questionable. It's not at all clear why we need to explain why something doesn't exist. No, I said it's not all clear why we need to explain why something doesn't exist. Of course, we can often give such an explanation, but it's not clear why there needs to be such an explanation as a kind of metaphysical principle. Plausibly, we simply need to explain why things exist. Now, I think Chad said that the arguments were valid, which is interesting because the argument here is invalid, right? Five doesn't follow from one. It says from one, but no, five doesn't follow from one. You'd have to add it only follows if we add a premise to the argument, namely that the only way for there to be an explanation for the fact that God doesn't exist is if something prevents God's existence. So the argument without that premise is just facially invalid. And of course, it's lacking the premise as it is here. Suppose now that we add this premise. Well, in that case, I think the argument is a hopeless failure for this added premise is just false, at least by my lights. If God doesn't exist, his non-existence is plausibly explained by the metaphysical impossibility of God's existence, as I pointed out earlier. Consider, again, why are there no square circles? Well, because to be a square is to have four sides, and to be a circle is to have no sides, and it's metaphysically impossible for something to have four sides and no sides. Done. We've explained why there are no square circles. There's no need for some existing thing that somehow prevents square circles from existing. That one is super confusing to me. I'd have to think about that a lot. Well, this one, James Ross, right? That's, that's the guy. Argument number 18, Christopher Weaver's modal cosmological let's, argument. Which, yeah, let's skip this argument because it's virtually identical to Rasmussen. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say um, number two has the problem, like, why should we ontologically commit to there being sums? Indeed, why should we ontologically commit to there being facts? But there's also, again, there's another symmetry problem for premise one here. We could equally say there's possibly no cause, right? You could say if there's a sum of purely contingent facts, it possibly has a cause. You could equally well say, oh, well, it possibly doesn't have a cause. And that, of course, would be incompatible with traditional theism, as I've explained earlier. Premise two is deeply implausible, as we've seen. Why does there have to be, like, why does there have to be this thing that is the sum of purely contingent facts? That just seems implausible. And, of course, the conclusion here is perfectly compatible with naturalism, because there are perfectly respectable, naturalist-friendly proposals of the foundational, necessarily existent layer of reality. Take another shot. It is possible that there is a purely contingent totality event that has a cause. It is impossible. Well, first of all, events are things that contain only contingent things, according to them. So I think one is true. Well, they give three reasons. It uh, follows from a principle, a general principle of causality. Um, there's nothing about a totality of purely contingent uh, events that's different from other purely contingent events. Uh, it's inductively safe. It's conceivable. Whatever's conceivable is possible. So they give some arguments for one. Okay, premise two. It is impossible that a cause of a purely contingent totality event is purely contingent. Three, if one and two, then it's possible that there is a cause that isn't purely contingent. Four, if three, then it's then there is a necessary thing that can be a cause. And so five, there is a necessary thing that can be a cause. Yeah, again, there's a symmetry problem for premise one here. You could equally well say it's possible that there is a purely contingent totality event that lacks a cause. And of course, that, as I've argued, it, that's going to be incompatible with traditional theism. And take another shot. The conclusion here is perfectly compatible with naturalism. Now, let's go back and just listen to some of the reasons that he said favor number one, because they could at least potentially break symmetry between one and the uh, symmetrical possibility premise. Well, first of all, events are things that contain only contingent things, according to them. So I think one is true. Well, they give three reasons. Uh, it follows from a principle, a general principle of causality. Well, 
it depends on what reasons favor that general principle of causality. But I guess in principle, that could be a symmetry breaker between one and the symmetrical possibility premise. It just it depends on the reasons that they offer, because symmetry might re-arise for those reasons. There's nothing about a totality of purely contingent uh, events that's different from other purely contingent events. Uh, it's inductively... Sim- you could, well, I mean, you could say there's nothing about purely contingent totality of events with respect to possibly lacking a cause that's different from other contingent events that also possibly lack causes. So you can equally say the same thing. Safe, it's conceivable, whatever. Conce- it's inductively safe. So I guess he means that inductively in our experience, the contingent events in our experience are such that they possibly have a cause. So we can at least inductively generalize defeasibly that I guess every contingent event, including, <laughs> including of course, a contingent totality event, would likewise possibly have a cause. Yeah, so that probably does provide at least some weight of a reason for breaking symmetry between the cases. Conceivable is possible, so I think it's some arguments for one. Okay, premise two. It is impossible. Whatever is conceivable is possible. Well, I can also conceive of a purely contingent totality event that lacks a cause, so that doesn't break symmetry. It seems as though we really only have an inductive symmetry breaker here, to be honest. And inductive generalizations are extremely weak. You can get so much inductive support for principles around here that are incompatible with traditional theism. There's lots of inductive support for saying that every concrete material object has a material cause in the sense of some things or stuff from which it is made. But of course, that's incompatible with traditional theism, according to which creation ex nihilo is true. So again, I mean, inductive generalization, you're going to have what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. You're going to be able to justify a boatload of other principles that are not going to be friendly to uh, theism. So, of course, that might be able to give some weight of a reason, breaking symmetry in favor of one. Firstly, it's not clear that that's enough to salvage the argument with enough plausibility. But secondly, induction is, is quite weak, and there are lots of theism-incompatible principles that are likewise supported by induction. So induction really isn't going to cut much here. All right, premise one. For any positive state of affairs that can begin to obtain, it is possible for there to be something external to it that causes it to obtain. Feel free to like add anything that you want because you've been you've been doing that as you have been listing out the arguments. Number two, it is possible for there to be a beginning of a positive state of affairs of its being the case that there exist contingent concrete things. Premise three, if one and two are true, then it is possible that there is a necessary concrete thing. Premise four, so it is possible that there is a necessary concrete thing. Five, it is possible that there is a, if it is possible that there is a necessary concrete thing, then there is a necessary concrete thing. And then a conclusion, so there is a necessary concrete thing. So the same symmetry problem is arguably going to be afflicting premise one. You can equally well say for any positive state of affairs that can begin to obtain, it's possible for there to be nothing external to it that causes it to obtain. And of course, that is, again, going to be incompatible with traditional theism, according to which anything that begins to obtain is going to have to ultimately be causally explained by God. Also, I think premise two is insufficiently motivated. Why would you think it's possible? This is a really grand modal claim about stuff extremely far removed from our ordinary experience. Conceivability here and things like that just really aren't going to cut it by my lights. Moreover, given an Aristotelian or powers-based or branching theory of modality, two here actually entails that there must be such a beginning. Like, it's necessarily the case that there is such a beginning. Because suppose that it were both possible for there to be a beginning of contingency and for there to be no beginning of contingency. Suppose that those are both individually possible. Well, then in the world in which there's no beginning of contingency, let's say contingently, contingency kind of spans the infinite past, well, then there would be no way to branch off from that infinite past contingency world to the world where contingency actually begins to exist. And similarly, vice versa, right? There would be no way to go from the world in which contingency begins to exist and somehow branch off from that world that shares a history with that world that branches off into the world that has an infinite past populated by contingent things. And so given this kind of Aristotelian powers-based or branching theory of modality on which something is possible, on which something is possible only if there's something actual with the causal power to kind of bring about that branch, well then, Premise two is only going to be true if it's necessarily the case that there's a beginning of contingency, that there is a beginning of the positive state of affairs of its being the case that there exist contingent concrete things. And in that case, two actually isn't so modest after all, is it? No, that's basic. this is basically, again, the same dialectic that comes up in modal ontological arguments. They're basically saying something like, uh, hey, well, it's like possible that God exists, but of course that strictly entails that God exists in System S5, which is, of course, the one that they're, they're using here. The same applies to two, right? Two is only true if it's necessarily the case that there's a beginning of contingency. So anyone who doesn't antecedently accept that it's necessarily the case that contingency begins would never grant that second premise. And similarly, just with the modal ontological argument stuff, I can equally well give a symmetrical premise here, which is going to be incompatible with this second one. So I can say it's possible for contingency to have no beginning. 
and given the branching actualist theory of modality, if that's true, well, then there actually cannot be such a beginning. And so we therefore have two incompatible possibility premises with a kind of epistemic symmetry between them. The first one, the one that is basically captured in premise two here, is that possibly contingency has a beginning. And then the, the reverse symmetry premise, which is incompatible with that, is that possibly contingency does not have a beginning. And so the question is, why should we accept the first one over the second one? Without a symmetry breaker, this argument here just fails. And of course, you're not going to be able to appeal to like conceivability and so on, because I can equally well conceive of contingency not having a beginning and so on. So I don't really think we should be sanguine about this argument. And of course, take a shot, because this conclusion here is perfectly compatible with naturalism. Our, and Descartes. Descartes' cosmological argument. This requires a little bit of... Descartes. Okay, so <laughs> I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, oh, this is one of the most painful arguments of the bunch. Um, well, actually, it's, it's not. Um, explanation here, uh, because he's got some terminology. Uh, so premise one is, there must be, in the cause of an idea, at least as much formal reality as the idea contains objective reality. Now, what he means by objective reality is the idea as it is represented in the mind. Now, a formal reality, by contrast, is the object's actual extramental reality. So here's an example. An idea, according to Descartes, is like a painting. The objective reality is the painting itself, whereas the formal reality is what the painting is of in the world, like the landscape, the actual landscape. So the formal reality of the painting is more real than the objective reality of the painting. And the objective reality... More... Okay. <laughs> So I, I reject that there's like degrees of reality. So something's like more real than another thing. Something either exists or it doesn't. I'm sorry. The, even just this distinction. I mean, I, I just reject it. So, I mean, the, the whole argument is just, it's like starting the race with cutting your legs off, but okay. Reality can never be as great or as perfect as the, the thing itself. Okay, so uh, two, I have the idea of God. Three, my idea of God is the effect of some cause. Four, the idea of God has infinite objective reality. So the idea of God has a cause. With, it, with infinite formal reality, no finite substance, such as myself, can be the cause of my idea of God. Only an infinite substance can be the cause of my idea of God, so God exists. Yeah, so premise one seems to me just entirely unmotivated, firstly. Why must there be, in the cause of an idea, at least as much formal reality as the idea contains objective reality? The atheist could equally well say, uh, no, this premise is false, precisely because, firstly, we have the idea of God. Secondly, God doesn't exist. So there's nothing with infinite formal reality. And yet our idea of, of God is an idea of an infinite being. So it contains infinite objective reality or whatever. So the atheist could just say, no, I mean, this argument itself inspires a counterexample to its first premise. But anyway, premise one, I just reject the metaphysics underlying this argument. And secondly, premise one, I just don't see any reason to believe it. Firstly, uh, it seems unmotivated and also it seems just extremely implausible. I can represent super high cardinalities in my mind, like Aleph, not not Aleph Null, but like Aleph Quadrillion. My idea seems to contain like Aleph Subtrillion objective reality, maybe? Is there some reality with like Aleph Subtrillion formal reality? What does that even mean? Like, <laughs> how are we like quantifying formal reality? Like how much reality something has? This is just ludicrous. Okay, sorry. Anyway, I recognize that I am not a Descartes scholar, so there may very well be things that I am eliding here, that I am overlooking. So, yeah, let's just move on. Oh, well, actually, let's not move on because premise six here is just, I think, obviously false. Right, a finite substance could be the cause of one's idea of God. We can do this thing called abstraction and negation, right? So we see various finite and limited things around us. And we can come up with the concept of the infinite and the unlimited just by abstracting, firstly, from the various finite limited things to the concept of finitude, limitation, and so on, and then just negating those, right? Saying, no, it's not finite. To simplify it down to bare bones, it would be, I have an idea of a perfect being, God. Ideas like other things have causes, some by other ideas, some by extra mental realities the ideas are of. Three, my idea of God cannot have been caused by other ideas of my own. And the idea here is that uh, God, the idea of God is innate in me. I am implicitly aware of God as a perfect being because I am aware of myself as an imperfect being. Uh, so the conclusion is, so my idea of God is caused by the extra mental reality it is an idea of, namely that which actually possesses a perfection, God. Yeah, so I would say premise two here needs modification. I'd say some by other ideas, some by extra mental realities the ideas are of, and some by extra mental realities the ideas are not of, right? So oftentimes ideas come to us Cause, that are caused in us by things that the ideas aren't of. So it's not like other ideas of ours cause it, and it's not like we ourselves cause it, but it's also not the things that the ideas are of that cause it. Rather, it's just other things that just maybe 
like remind us some way and some subconscious process kicks off or whatever. I also think premise three is just false. I've already shown a strategy as to how one's idea of God could be caused in some sense by other ideas of your own together with various intellective operations. You have ideas of finitude. You can gain that by your own powers of abstraction. You just look around us and you see various things that are limited and finite in various ways. Then you just negate that to say not finite, so infinite, uh, not limited, so unlimited, and so on. And so that's how you can start to have an idea of God. It's this unlimited being. And then you can say it's unlimited in knowledge and power and so on. And, you know, we see knowledge and power and so on in our experience. So I think just three is just clearly false. Um, and then, of course, we have parody problems here. So I, I could say, hey, I have the idea of a maximally evil god. Ideas have causes in terms of other ideas or in terms of what they're of, their intentional objects. But, of course, my idea of an evil god couldn't be caused by other ideas of my own, right? After all, an evil god that has infinite objective reality, and so it has to be caused by something with infinite formal reality. Oh, So there's an evil god, because it's either caused by other ideas of mine, which it can't be, or it's caused by the thing that it's of, namely its intentional object. And of course, this is an idea of an evil god, so it's caused by an evil god, so there's an evil god. And of course, if that's true, traditional theism is false, because on traditional theism, God himself isn't evil, and moreover, God doesn't create another God, which is evil. So, of course, if that's true, then traditional theism is false, so traditional theism is false. Looks like we've got an argument against God's existence here. Complicated argument, uh, but uh, once you understand the scholastic terminology he uses, it's pretty interesting. We got one more cosmological argument to cover. Uh, one, everything has a cause. Two, if everything has a cause, then the universe has a cause. So the universe has a cause, and it's God. There you go. And for the resources here, uh, you can find this argument defended by uh, no one, ever. So I'm actually glad that Chad included this, because I see people talk about, oh, the cosmological argument, and they literally present something like this, like everything has a cause. <sighs> it causes me so much pain every time I see it. So, um, yeah, anyway, I'm glad that we're making fun of this because it deserves as much derision as it can possibly get. Dude, like the Royal Society Institute of Philosophy or something like that posted a, a video the other day with Julian Bagini or whatever, and he's a professional philosopher. <laughs> and he was talking about the cosmological argument. And of course, he gives he gives an argument. One of the premises is everything has a cause. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so painful. It's like, he should be embarrassed. Like, Julian Bagini, if you're watching this, you should be embarrassed. You can tell that I've been recording and it's very late at night, so lots of stuff is coming out. But no thinker in the history of traditional cosmological arguments has defended an argument seriously with this first premise everything has a cause i mean okay maybe you're maybe you like your 5 year old dog defends a premise like that but no serious thinker within the theistic tradition has ever put forward any argument remotely like this and yet you still see like crash course philosophy you know hank green or whatever making videos where he talks about the cosmological argument and of course one of his premises is like everything has a cause and of course he's like attributing this to aquinas it's like this is so absurd like how can you get away with this and of course it has like millions of views or whatever so it's like it it's so pathetic like how how do you get away with that anyway sorry off my high horse we're actually done with the cosmological arguments